everybody, it's James Lindsay, and you are listening to the New Discourses podcast, and it's time for a very exciting episode because we're going to talk about Soros. It is long past time we talked about George Soros. And so that's the topic today. What I'm going to do is I want to lay out my best guess at how George Soros operates based on what I know, based on what I've observed, and based on having read not quite all of, but a significant portion now of his uh, most famous book, his 1992 book, The Alchemy of Finance, which has the subtitle, Reading the Mind of the Market, which is a little bit pretentious. And so this is going to be a fairly long episode, as it tends to be, because I want to do this right. But I'm going to give you the punchline up front. I'm going to tell you a kind of off-the-cuff summary of what I think George Soros' method is. And then we're going to get into what his goals look like and his character and lots of things to kind of put legs under that. And we're going to conclude with where we start with a summary of what George Soros's methods are. And um, I wrote my notes without this riff at the beginning. So it's going to be, it's like I'm unfolding a mystery throughout how I wrote these notes, but I'm going to tell you the end of the story first. And that might take away from the dramatic part, but I think it's going to make it a lot easier to pay attention and follow and understand. Um, plus, if you are short on time, you'll get the gist in the first few minutes. And here's what George Soros is about. George Soros believes that history is made during chaotic times. He calls those uh, periods of time historical periods. And so his history is actually made during chaos. The reason history is made during chaos is because in chaotic conditions, people will move a long way. Basically, he says there are two types of conditions. There are close to equilibrium conditions, and there are far from equilibrium conditions. Chaos is far from equilibrium and uh, a stable situation is close to equilibrium. So the characterization of equilibrium in general is that when you have equilibrium and you perturb the system, that's the technical terminology for it, a system that has uh, at least what's called stable equilibrium will come back toward uh, the equilibrium state. So if you have something that's balanced and it's got a stable equilibrium situation, say a ball at the bottom of a bowl, and you push the ball off to the side, you perturb the system, it will roll up the side of the bowl, and it will come back down, and it will come back to the equilibrium position. That's called a stable equilibrium. If you have the bowl upside down and set it on top, however, that's an unstable equilibrium, and if you perturb it, the definition of an unstable equilibrium is when you perturb a system, it's a stable equilibrium system if it moves back toward the equilibrium, and it is an unstable equilibrium system if it moves away from the equilibrium. In fact, uh, you can imagine the ball either inside the bowl, that's stable equilibrium, and an unstable equilibrium, you can imagine a ball balanced exactly on top of uh, the bowl, and if you touch it a little bit, it's going to roll off because it's going to start rolling downhill. Okay, the idea though is that chaotic conditions are a little bit different. Dynamic systems are a little different than stable and unstable equilibrium, but historical change for George Soros occurs during chaotic conditions, which means that you can't necessarily predict what's going to happen next. Now, George Soros has a very peculiar belief which is that, in fact, history moves according to people's misperceptions of what's going on. That's very peculiar. But this gives us enough insight to give the quick summary of what his deal is. If you have a society and you want to move it to a new system, what you might call meta-system change, or just system change, but usually we want something even bigger, meta-system change, a complete reorganization of the way that we think about uh, our society. Uh, the societal paradigm has to shift completely. It's not just that you replace, say, Democrats with Republicans or something like this. It would be a system change. It's a complete revamping of how we think about the organization of society. If you want to do that, Soros believes it happens in disequilibrium conditions and, in fact, chaotic conditions. The reason is because it moves according to people's misperceptions. And so, because it moves according to people's misperceptions, they're desperate to make sense of their chaotic world, and they will follow whatever guideposts seem to make sense that are put in front of them. In other words, when there are chaotic conditions, people are easy to propagandize. You can tell them where you want them to go, and if you can kind of make the case for them, 
they'll go there and you can get the desired change, which we will at later discover the phrase that he, uh, Soros uses for that is operational success. Well, what if your society is not in chaos? Well, if you want to make historical change, the first thing you have to do is you have to perturb it and perturb it and perturb it and perturb it until it's in chaos. So when you look at the cities, why do Soros DAs refuse to prosecute crime and they tend to do all these things? Because it creates chaos and chaotic conditions require people to look for signposts or guideposts to get through it. And you can guide them to where you want. In other words, you can create a new change. You can change toward a desired state of affairs by pushing a stable system into chaotic instability and then telling people, basically propagandizing people into believing that this is the way out of the chaos, which sounds very much like the dialectical approach of create a problem, utilize the reaction to get to a predetermined solution on the other side, because in fact, Soros, in his own words, says his method is dialectical. So here's the short, short version of George Soros. Take a society that's doing okay, whether through agitating their cities with crime, nullifying their borders, overwhelming their system through immigration, whatever, the things that he funds, dumping identity politics into the situation, funding a lot of that. Take a system that's stable, destabilize it until it breaks into a chaotic situation. In the process, make sure that you point the arrow of the chaos roughly in the direction you want things to go, and then start laying down propaganda pieces that are going to take society in the direction that you want it to come out of the chaos into a new system. That's why Soros does what he does. Why does Soros fund these DAs? Why does he fund the border stuff? Why does he fund critical race theory? Why does he do it? Because it destabilizes the American system, pushes it into a state of chaos, and in the state of chaos, people are easily propagandized to take to a system change or meta system change according to his goals. So what are George Soros's goals? Well, he tells us in one of the last chapters of The Alchemy of Finance, he tells us after many, many pages of talking about how basically everybody doing economics and finance is wrong, they misunderstand the fundamental premises, they don't understand that economics and finance are both reflexive environments, they are not specifically kind of classical economic environments, uh, they are subject, therefore, to what he calls boom and bust cycles. Boom and bust cycles are very simple. Basically, a bubble starts to build where people are misperceiving. Everything's down to misperceptions. People misperceive that the economy is doing better than it actually is, or a commodity is doing better, or a stock is doing better than it is. So it inflates and it inflates and it inflates, and you get a very large amount of discrepancy between its perceived value and its actual value. This is a very unstable situation that in dynamic systems analysis and mathematics actually would tend into when that number and that when that misperception gets big enough, it would tend into a chaotic analysis, a chaotic uh, a dynamic behavior system. Uh, so this this is what he wants to push situations into. But it's because he doesn't want that to happen. So what happens is, like I was saying, the economy inflates around misperceptions of value that eventually goes berserk during the chaos. It, so it expands very slowly to much bigger than it should be. Then it contracts very quickly. That's boom is a big slow gain and then bust is a big short collapse. And that causes a lot of damage and a lot of chaos that in turns out to be unpredictable and difficult to guide in the direction you want it to be. But he says that there are ways around it and his policy recommendations near the end of the book. These are George Soros's big picture goals other than this open society thing that is the basis for his Open Society Foundation, which is the name of his major nonprofit, or his big NGO, it's big money, big money NGO. It's called the Open Society Foundation. We'll talk about open societies in a moment. Uh, but his big goals that he says that will make this boom-bust cycle manageable, less damaging, and in fact more directable are A, an international central bank that is able to actually intervene through monetary means to prevent this market instability or correct for it when it begins to tamp down on um, vicious cycles where things start running out of control, and also a universal international currency that is ideally, both of these would be ideally global, a global central bank with a global international currency um, that everybody uses. And this can only work 
in George Soros's mind in what you would call an international open society. So in some sense, picture the EU, but global. The passports, you don't really need to take your passport to go from one EU country to another. The currency is all the same. It's very easy, allegedly, to travel between them. And so this is the rough picture. Now just explode that out to the globe. Uh, so a international or global central bank with an international or global central currency and an open society. And I'll get to his definition of open society later, but the short version of that is it's a society in which everybody can participate in the shaping of the future direction of society, which is a um, very kind of utopian critical thinking or theory, I should say, critical theory kind of vision for society. Um, it's a uh, moving target, he says, but it is also a, a kind of utopian f state of freedom. Okay, now that's his goals, and he spends an entire chapter near the end of the Alchemy of Finance dedicated to explaining these goals and their importance, but that's not our purposes, so we're not going to get into those. I just want you to know where he wants things to go. So if he's going to aim for meta system change, we should know what system he wants to head to, and it's an international central bank that ideally is global, that issues an international, ideally global central currency that operates around what he calls an open society that is, again, ideally global. You don't say, oh, well, the United States is a pretty open society, so why does he attack the United States? That's not it. It's not a global open society. The United States, in fact, is a major issue for him, as you can tell, because he's attacking it. And the reason isn't specifically because he hates the United States. It's actually because he thinks it's an overvalued asset that's created a uh, kind of market bubble uh, that needs a correction, as we'll, as we'll hear. But this isn't the point. Um, for our purposes, it's just enough to acknowledge that these are his goals that he has them, that he holds them, and that he's aiming toward them. And it won't be necessary for us to get into the weeds of, uh, of them. What we need to know instead is what he believes and the methods by which he believes it might be achieved. It's not how specifically a policy, you know, this or that changes that he thinks matter. That's the target. And then he has a method of moving along the line toward that. Um, so that's the purpose of this podcast is to focus on Soros's unique use of what he calls the reflexive method to achieve his aims, which includes those goals at the long end of the, the road. It's very important to keep that big picture in mind, but we're going to focus on the method. So we have to actually start, the, the, the method he uses is called reflexivity. It relies on things called fertile fallacies. There's a lot of terminology here that's going to be very difficult. Um, and the way that I've organized the podcast, I'm actually going to start by reading to you excerpts out of the epilogue so that we understand who George Soros is a little bit better because he gives away a lot of that in the epilogue, as it turns out, more than maybe he actually fully wanted to reveal, uh, as he says he would possibly be embarrassed. But we also have uh, embarrassed by what he's disclosing about himself. But we have to actually look at these terms a little bit too first. So, so just like I wanted to give you a big picture of what his, his method is, let's break down the terms um, and the key term here in specific is the reflexive method. This podcast is really about reflexivity as George Soros defines it and uses it. And he doesn't actually define reflexive specifically in the epilogue. And so I have to do a little bit of legwork here to give it to you. Um, and we're going to come back to it at length where he does define it in the introduction and especially the first chapter, which is dedicated to defining it. Uh, a short summary definition that's pretty technical still will suffice for the moment. A reflexive state is one where the outputs of a dynamic system are also its inputs. Okay, does that make sense? So it's like you have a function, you have inputs into the function box, and there are outputs. But it turns out that our perceptions about the outputs or the outputs themselves, in fact, come back and work as input. So it's kind of recursive, or as a matter of fact, that's the word he uses is reflexive. Another way to put this that's a little more graspable is that a reflexive state is a situation in which the expectations of the participants about its outcomes are one of the parameters that define how the situation is going to evolve. What does that mean? That means that if you expect a stock to go up, then you'll behave in a way that makes the stock go up. If you expect a stock to go down, you'll behave in a way that makes the stock go down. That's 
the basic summary of it. And Soros thinks this is some brilliant insight. Mathematicians have studied this behavior forever. Uh, I mean, not forever, but for at least a couple hundred years under the heading of dynamic uh, systems analysis. And we use tools called coupled differential equations. And it seems at one point in the book, uh, in the first chapter, that, that Soros is very proud of himself for discovering the idea that reflexivity is a pair of coupled equations that would probably be in practice differential equations that describe market behavior. Um, what is What are coupled differential equations in dynamic systems analysis? It, we, we don't have to talk about what a differential equation is that's beside the point, um, but it, the, the coupled part means that the dependent variables of the equations involved form the independent variables of the other equations. So if it's f of x equals y, then the other function is f of y equals x or something like that. So the inputs and outputs of the various, if you want to know, for example, um, how a population is changing, it turns out that there are parameters like how much food is available, what the population already is, the inputs. And in fact, what the population already is, is one of the variables that determines how a population is going to change. Why? Because it's generally exponential. And so if you have 100 coyotes, it's going to be something to do with having 100 coyotes, exponential growth over the next growth cycle that's going to get you there. But if you only have 10 coyotes, it's not like a, a linear thing. So the population, which is what you're trying to find out, is also one of the inputs to the equation to find the population. So it sounds circular, but it's not. And there are ways to deal with that in mathematics, in particular, like I said, coupled differential equations and dynamic systems analysis have been handling this for a long time. People know what to do with this, and there are very, very good methods, not usually for solving these, but for approximating solutions to these, and we can get really good understandings. Soros, it's kind of funny to me, thinks that he has this huge insight about reflexive circumstances to identify that the market is a dynamic system, and that the way that we characterize dynamic systems in mathematics might apply to that. Um, it's a little more complicated than that uh, because the market is a little bit stochastic. That means there's randomness involved. And I think he misses the fact that that actually has a lot to do with what he's actually dealing with. Um, I'm not sure that he has very much mathematical savvy, to be honest. He obviously knows how to calculate things and make guesses, but he seems not to know the deeper mathematics very well or doesn't or um, communicate it in a way that indicates that he knows what it is. But reflexive situations, what are they? For Soros, they are ones in which people's expectations about the outcomes influence the outcomes. In other words, they're reflexive in the sense that they're self-referential. That's the idea of reflexivity. Another way you can put reflexive, just to make another idea, is it's things that become true or false depending on whether or not people believe that they're true or false. We go back to the stock idea. Very simple. If you believe a stock is going to, or a commodity is going to go up in value, and you buy the stock, guess what? The stock value goes up because people bought the stock. So if a lot of people believe the stock value is going to go up, the stock value goes up. So their expectations about what the stock is going to do actually influence what the stock does. Same thing if it's going down. That's it. It's not really that complicated. But he thinks that this is a huge insight. And it turns out that for Soros, and this is the big takeaway, he calls it reading the mind of the market. But what Soros is very clear on is he, his analysis through most of the book is strictly about market things. But he's always dipping in this kind of broader point. And the broader point is this is actually his theory of change. This is how he believes history changes. This is how he believes that societies change as well. And so he thinks not just that this describes what it is, but just like when he makes lots of money in the market, that this is something you can use to profit off of system change, uh, whether that's market systems, whether that's societal or political systems. So you can direct things in a direction that you want them to go. For example, you could perhaps start driving a reflexive state into which people believe that a stock is going to lose value very quickly or that the stock is overvalued. And meanwhile, you could buy a bunch of shorts on that stock. And then when the thing tanks, you make a bunch of money. Operational success, in other words. Knowing a little bit about how this all works um, allows us to explain what Soros means what means to achieve, how he's going to achieve it, and what he means actually by an open society. Um, which he also, like I said, believes has to be global with a universal international bank and universal currency. But what's most important is this is not really about markets. 
It's really that he wants a new social, political, and economic system that could support this vision he has for a market that has evolved past the boom and bust cycle. So let's actually quote from the epilogue, quote Soros here. We'll begin quoting him uh, to tell you what, what he thinks. He says, even if we learn to think in terms of reflexive and recursive relations, we are confronted with a substantive choice. Should society take a predetermined shape or should its members be allowed to determine the form of society in which they live? The former kind of society has been described by Karl Popper as closed, the latter as open. So thus we get this idea of what he means by an open society in this quote. What he's talking about is that when you have a reflexive situation that governs the dynamics of a circumstance, the market, or a society, in this case a society, there's a question. Should there be a predetermined shape that you're aiming toward, like the Soviet Union had, or should its members be allowed to, should it be open-ended? Should its members be allowed to determine what shape it takes, you know, day by day? And what he says is that a close, following Karl Popper, who is his mentor, uh, that a closed society has a predetermined shape that it's forcing people toward, and he's very against those. So he'd be very against Sovietism. He'd be very against Actually, China, he is. Uh, but an open society, the people get to determine the direction that it goes. Now, this is a perfect parallel, and we'll come back and talk about this a lot, to the critical theorists, to neo-Marxism. Neo-Marxism abandoned Marx's idea of going to a particular destination, and they said instead that the revolution has to be continuous. We could just say in Soros' language that the reflexivity has to be continuous. Because what he's saying with reflexive and recursive relations, what he's actually saying is that when you understand history in terms of a dialectic, that's literally what he says reflexivity is, so I'm not making that up, I'm not riffing, I'm not like speculating, that's actually what he says it is, that when you're working with a dialectical theory of change, that you have two choices. One of those choices is that the dialectic points at something that is intended from the outset, that's a closed society, and one is that it does not point towards something that's closed uh, off at the out from the outset. In fact, it's it's open, it could go anywhere. And it turns out that this is the same idea that the neo-Marxists had, which is why Soros is so enmeshed with neo-Marxist ideas and funds things. His Open Society Foundation funds a lot of the queer theory, for example, but it also funds very specifically the African American Policy Forum, which was headed by, or is headed by Kimberly Crenshaw, who created critical race theory and does critical race theory things in policy all the time. It's a think tank that the Soros Open Society Foundation spun off because he's in line with, actually, the communism doesn't know how picture of neo-Marxism. Let's not describe the ideal society. Let's just critique the society that we have in the ways that we don't like it. And why? Because if we critique the society that we have in the ways that we don't like it, we can destabilize the existing society to get to revolutionary conditions. Those revolutionary conditions are also chaotic conditions, and then you can lead people into a new system and if it's an open society, it just and never means you never know what the next part of the new system is. And in the critical theory ideas, and then you have another revolution. Well, actually, Soros agrees with that. You would have another state in which you do the same thing to direct it more toward thine heart's desire to take it where you want it to go. So even though something like the United States, because he wants this to be really an international order or global, ideally, even though the United States is in a sense the most open society that's ever existed, by Soros's vision, it's actually a huge problem. And this is why he's so against the U.S. This is why he attacks the U.S. Why? Because of dollar dominance. Because the U.S. dollar, because the United States, in fact, is a economic superpower unlike the world has ever seen. Because of dollar dominance, everyone in the world is dependent on a U.S.-led social, political, and economic system. So guess what? While it might be an open society for Americans, it's not an open society for anybody else because their state is determined by the course of the United States. They don't have a say. If we have dollar dominance, the rest of the world does not have a say in the direction of history. So it's not actually maximally open for everyone. So that makes the U.S. a big problem if you believe in a global international open society, which is what George Soros believes in. So the U.S. is, in a meaningful sense, an oppressor by virtue of its superpower status on the world stage. So the U.S. is, to Soros, a direct impediment to establishing this 
a new global economy with a new global currency managed through a new global central bank, but also the idea that we would have a global open society. It's a local open society, but it's not a global open society, and therefore it disenfranchises the people outside of its uh, parameters. So he sounds like a communist, but that's a myth. Soros is not a communist, or at least he's not a Soviet-style communist. I would say if we did this whole, and I don't want to get into it right now, this communism 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 thing where what we're looking at in the world being installed right now is, in a sense, communism 3.0. He's closer to communism 3.0 than he probably would like to admit. Uh, Like I said, he's adopted a lot of the same views, but in slightly different ways than the neo-Marxists. But he, in terms of communism 2.0, which is the Soviet style, or or communism 1.0, which is Marx specifically, Soros explicitly says that he's not in favor of those, and his actions back that up. He has been named an international terrorist and a demon by the CCP, specifically because he doesn't want the closed society model of the CCP. This actually causes friction for him with his longtime friends at the World Economic Forum because he thinks that their system mirrors the CCP's a little bit too much, and he doesn't want the closed society model at all. Soros, it turns out, is in some sense, weirdly, an anti-communist, at least if we take Marx as the measure of communism, or if we take you know, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao in the Soviet system or the CCP system as the measure of communism. In other words, communism in reality. He's actually against those things. But the thing is, is what he's not against, and in fact, what he adopts perfectly is the communist dialectical method. He also adopts many of the goals of the communist visions. When Lenin talks about a democratic society where everybody actually is equal, not a bourgeois democracy where only the people with status and prestige and wealth have uh, democratic power, but everybody has equal democratic power. Soros's open society is pretty close to that. His definition where everybody has the capacity to shape the uh, course of the society in a very meaningful way. So nobody's really politically or socially or economically oppressed. That, as a matter of fact, is very similar to the ideal democracy that the communists believed in, but he didn't, uh, and that the the, the neo-Marxists believe in, but he doesn't think that Marx actually lays that out. In fact, he says that Marx's vision is diametrically opposed to his own because it seeks to determine a preset future, which is this transcendent uh, communism, instead of leaving it open-ended, which would be the open society, and able to go wherever people want it to go. So he doesn't, he, he takes the exact methods of communism and he has many of the aspirations of a communist system uh, in the ideal, but he's actually against forcing people into a communist system. If, it, if the system is open and it happens to evolve continuously towards something that looks like a, uh, a communist system, that's fine. But if it took some other shape, that would be fine too. The thing is, as long as it's going to be an open society where everybody has the capacity to participate in the so-called democratic processes, that this just happens to match what Lenin called an ideal democracy and what Mao said was the point of his democratic centralism following Stalin and Lenin is maybe just a coincidence. And the fact that it follows exactly the idea of the neo-Marxists that, well, we're going to overthrow whatever levels of oppression we could find, and then whatever new system comes out, we're going to overthrow the levels of oppression there. In other words, we're going to keep opening. They they use the word liberate, and and Soros uses the word open, but it's basically the same thing. We're going to open society further. We're going to liberate society from systems of oppression that, what do the systems of oppression do? They keep them, some people, by virtue of some group identity from having full participation in the shaping of society. Well, Soros is literally exactly in line with that. So, At any rate, I don't want to lie about Soros, though, and Soros, in his own words, is very, very clear, not once, but many times, that he is not a Marxist, just to be very clear about what he says. So it's it's all a little complicated. Marx's vision is a positive transcendence of private property, is human self-estrangement. His vision for the completion of history is um, not really that sim- that different than Soros's. Everybody gets to self-determine and determine the shape of society equally without any impediments from systems uh, of power. Other than the fact that Marx's fantasy is a delusional vision where he actually dis- differs from Soros than is 
that Soros doesn't seek to transcend private property necessarily. He kind of likes capital, uh, and uh, he does want people to live in a perfectly, I guess, social existence, but not one where people are sharing all their stuff necessarily. Uh, Soros's goal is actually to establish a global order with a single society and a single currency in which everyone has the opportunity for equal participation and equal input into the determination of how society evolves. That is a nice utopia. And if it ends up communist, that's fine. If it ends up some other way, that's fine. But as long as it's a global system, not delimited by the, any forces of exclusion from participation in the shaping of society, that would also be fine. It's all about whether the system prevents some people from access to the mechanisms of determining how society develops further and evolves. That's the open society model. And so when the rubber meets the road, though, the main way that Soros differs from communism would seem to be that communism attempts to force a particular answer uh, because it believes it knows what the answer to the riddle of history is. In Marx's words, he said communism is the answer uh, to the riddle of history and it knows itself to be the solution. And Soros says, no, it actually, we don't know what the answer to that question is. But that actually just puts Soros in line with the neo-Marxists um, with a little bit of math, which uh, I will not lie, the neo-Marxists were not exactly math people. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever seen any math that made any sense in any of their stuff. Now, that means what Soros looks a lot more like is the neo-Marxist liberationism that informs woke. So that's why Soros looks so woke in the way that he behaves. It's intentionally meant to be open-ended without definition. So I've mentioned that we would talk about some of the, the critical theorists. Let's talk about Paulo Freire, the, the educator. Paulo Freire was very clear. He said, we cannot know what shape a liberated future will take because otherwise we would try to force it through means that would eventually become bureaucratic and sclerotic, requiring another revolution. We'll read that in a minute. Theodore Adorno said something very similar. So, you know, very key neo-Marxist. He said that it's not possible to present an image of the utopia in the positive. You can only approach the utopia from the negative. You can only discuss what you don't like about the existing society, and then the utopia is what's left when we continue to open up all of the pieces of the oppression box. So we can't describe utopia. We know it's out there. We just can't describe it in any positive terms. But what it looks like is, as I've said before, not that. Whatever there is, not that. That's not perfectly open. It's not perfectly liberated. So whatever we have, not that. So change it again. This is also Herbert Marcuse, the most famous of the neo-Marxists, was extraordinarily, and I mean extraordinarily, uh, utopian. He's very clear about how utopian he is. And this, he said that utopianism is achieved, kind of like these other guys, through what he calls negative thinking. And he says in the essay on liberation that this is where negative thinking necessarily becomes positive. And what they means is that you're stripping away the oppressive forces of society. And he says that the ideal society is contained within and being liberated from uh, the systems of oppression that characterize the current society, which might call repressive tolerance or whatever. And so what the utopia looks like for all of these guys, and I mean, Frady, Adorno, Marcuse, and George Soros is a utopia of no exclusion from the societal shaping historical processes. Here's how I said we we're going to read from Paulo Freire. Here's what Paulo Freire said about it in The Politics of Education, which I read in great depth previously. He says, because men are historical beings, in other words, they're people who participate in the shaping of society. That's what that means. Okay, so that's what Soros is after. That's what an open society is, is when everybody's that way. Freire's idea is that we're going to wake up everybody to make them realize they're, quote, historical beings. In other words, they're people who participate in the shaping of society. They're participants in a open society that's just not allowing themselves to be open yet. That's the whole critical theory premise. George Soros is not much different. The only difference is that he's not particularly hostile to capital. That's the main difference. But be, this is Freire again. Because men are historical beings, incomplete and conscious of being incomplete, how would Soros phrase this as we'll hear that we misperceive, we are always biased and we can be conscious that we're always biased. But anyway, because men are historical beings, incomplete and conscious of being incomplete, revolution is as natural and permanent a human dimension as is education. 
only a mechanistic mentality holds that education can cease at a certain point or that revolution can be halted when it attains power. To be authentic, revolution must be a continuous event. Oh, it has to be open-ended. How about that? Otherwise, Freddie tells us, it will cease to be revolution and it will become sclerotic bureaucracy. In other words, it will have a predetermined shape that it's trying to push everybody toward. It will become a closed society. Literally, Frady and Soros are saying the same thing, just to be very clear. But this is what Frady says about what he's actually talking about. He's not calling it reflexivity or any of this. What he says is revolution is always cultural, whether it be in the phase of denouncing an oppressive society and proclaiming the advent of a just society, or maybe we'd phrase that denouncing a closed society and proclaiming the advent of an open society, right? Or in the phase of the new society inaugurated by the revolution. In the new society, the revolutionary process becomes cultural revolution. And so what does Soros stoke? Which, I don't know if you missed what I said, but he says the same thing that Freddy says. We can do Freddy back and forth to Soros if you want. I read Soros a few seconds ago. We can do this here about his definitions of open and closed societies. It's the same thing. And what uh, what Freddy says is that the point of it is to, inst- is to uh, spark cultural revolution. A perpetual cultural, cultural revolution, as a matter of fact, a continuous cultural revolution. But that's what Soros wants out of the reflexive process, and that's why he aligns so neatly with neo-Marxism, because his program is basically neo-Marxism that doesn't hate capital. So the key difference between Soros and the neo-Marxists is just that Soros is comfortable with embracing capital while they were very skeptical of it. In fact, they wanted to abolish capital in the end. Um, and maybe that, in fact... Soros is not, he, he's very critical, he's very strongly critical. And I mean that in the sense that he brings up, you know, how his critical disposition suited him like lots of times. So he is, and he thinks everything's contaminated by bias. So he has a very strong critical attitude, but he doesn't have the relentless, ruthless criticism that we see characterizing critical theory. Um, and we could also add that Soros is very clearly, if you read this book, very smart. And most of the critical theorists, maybe, you know, Marcuse, Horkheimer, and Adorno or whatever exempted. Most of the critical theorists, at least on the ground, are pretty dumb, uh, frankly, just to put it very, very bluntly. But let's read what um, what Soros thinks about capital. So this is the last paragraph. I know I told you I was going to read out of the epilogue, but this is the last paragraph of the introduction to the alchemy of finance. And here's what he says. He says, I should like to emphasize that this book is not meant to provide a practical guide to getting rich in the stock market. Most of what I know is in the book, at least in a theoretical form. I have not kept anything deliberately hidden, but the chain of reasoning operates in the opposite direction. I am not trying to explain how to use my approach to make money. Rather, I am using my experiences in the financial markets to develop an approach to the study of historical processes in general and the present historical moment in particular. So I'll pause here and we'll come back to him in a second. So he's telling you that he's using his economic stuff. The whole reflexivity economic stuff is really about historical processes. That's what he's actually interested in studying. Dialectical analysis of historical processes, which is the same methodology that Hegel uses, the same methodology that Marx uses, the same methodology that the neo-Marxists use, but they use them all in slightly different ways. But just to be very clear. He said, if I did not believe that my investment activities can serve that purpose, I would not want to write about them. Sure, he would just probably make money. As long as I am actively engaged in business, I would be better off to keep them a trade secret. But I would value it much more highly than any business success if I could contribute to an understanding of the world in which we live, or better yet, if I could help to preserve the economic and political system that has allowed me to flourish as a participant. Notice that that is not a revolutionary sentiment. That's the money sentence right there. Okay, we see one piece of Soros' character that he wants to contribute to an understanding of the world in which we live, like on a high level, it's more than big business and making money. He wants to be a historical figure. But what's even better than that, if I could preserve not revolutionary sentiment right there, the economic and political system, in other words, a capital-driven, what he would think of as open democracy that has allowed him to flourish as a participant. This is a pretty solid evidence that George Soros is not actually a communist, except that it just so happens that the kind of open society vision that he has aligns with the idealistic 
uh, ideal democracy and ideal economy that communism posits as the transcendent end of history. But we have no reason not to take Soros at his word here. Um, he, he's not advocating for confiscating and redistributing wealth unless that just happens to be a useful tool in order to move things around in historical processes. He is not advocating for revolution like Freddy did. That's the only place, unless we kind of fiddle around with the wording a little bit, that, that there's a significant difference. He is okay with capital. He doesn't want to overthrow that. He also believes in a democratic system of governance. But there's a lot, as we've talked about already, there's a lot of flexibility in what's meant by democratic. The point here is that we should we shouldn't deny Soros at his word that he wants to preserve the system. We should understand that his goal is not to preserve the economic system and political system exactly as they are, uh, but rather as they could be by making them more and more and more in line with a global open society, a single global society with a single central bank, with a single global currency, and a single broad uh, socio-cultural and political environment that facilitates that. Again, think the EU blown out to as much of the world as it could cover, uh, which could be like, imagine the United Nations, but empowered like the EU. Uh, that would be a kind of stepping stone, I guess, in the direction that he kind of imagines. Now, what about his critical attitude? Because he does have a critical attitude, and he's not identical to the critical theorists who are ruthless. Um, Soros openly states over and over again that he adopts a critical disposition and that he believes that everything in particular is biased. In fact, he thinks history moves through the misperceptions, and he says that misperceptions are bias. That he's not using bias in the kind of very narrow way necessarily that um, critical race theorists use it. Uh, it's if you have a misperception about the world, that's a bias, but it's especially a bias if it's like, you know, confirmation bias, something that you want to be true. I guess that's desirability bias, that you believe things are true because you want them to be true, or confirmation bias, that you believe something's true because uh, it can conforms to the things that you already think. Um, that's not how the critical theorists thought of bias. They were much more serious. The critical theory position is is that in fact that everything is necessarily corrupt and oppressive through various biases that benefit the the people that are more in power. And those biases, in fact, are spread like a mythology of society that what's called an ideology to keep people buying into the system that biases against them. So Let's look at, for example, just to kind of put some legs under that, the critical theorist Max Horkheimer, who was one of the major early directors of the Frankfurt School and the creator of critical theory. He said that the purpose of the critical theory was to admit that we cannot know the shape of what the ideal society should look like, at least not on the terms of the existing society. But we can criticize every aspect of society that we wish to change. And now he's Marxist, so he's deriving from Marx what criticism or critique means. And critique for Marx was ruthless criticism of all that exists. So Soros isn't quite that bad. Soros has a more modest and reasonable skepticism about the role of bias, even though he thinks it is omnipresent. Uh, and in fact, his uh, objective with reflexivity is to use bias, to make to utilize it, to move history the way that he wants to. And that actually has to start by accepting that it is there rather than to relentlessly make it the basis of all your critiques. Um, okay, so nonetheless, before we return to the epilogue uh, to understand more of Soros and his person and his purposes, it, we got a little bit more house cleaning to do or throat clearing, whichever we're doing at this point. It bears mentioning that this makes Soros very much a fellow traveler with a critical theory-based neo-Marxist way of thinking, even though he, in his own words, very explicitly opposes the classical Marxist way of thinking. Uh, but he's still a little bit distinct, even from the critical theory method and from the uh, Marxist deterministic science of history, which is what he ultimately rejects about Marxism and his dialectical materialism. Okay, so now the epilogue, because this is important to knowing who Soros is. The epilogue of this book is short and very revealing. 
We're not going to read all of it because I've got a lot to cover and I want to focus on reflexivity. And because Soros basically always writes with a whole bunch of waffle. Um, frankly, if you read it, there's a lot of I really like me. I'm George Soros. I think I'm great waffling in there. Here, look how smart I am. Um, but this is how Soros starts his epilogue to The Alchemy of Finance. He writes, the unifying theme of this book is the concept of reflexivity. I have focused on its implications for the social sciences in general and financial markets in particular. I have left other areas largely unexplored. I should like to mention them briefly here, although my thoughts relating to them are not properly developed. They ought to form the subject of another book in the future, but I am afraid I may not have a chance to write it, especially if I may remain involved in financial markets. First is the question of values. Economic theory has trained us to take values as a given, although the evidence suggests that they are shaped by a reflexive process. So let's start right there, because um, I'm about to skip a lot of waffling. But the first thing that he wants to say in his epilogue, that when it says that, that this is uh, that his thoughts in the epilogue refer to things that go outside of financial markets uh, and the social sciences, he's actually talking about the processes of historical change. He wants to talk about literally historical change, the meaning of life. That's the kind of big questions. And he thinks reflexivity is very uh, poignant to answering what that's about. And he starts off with values, which are also outside of those domains. And he says that values are shaped by a reflexive process. Reflexive process means that it's a feedback loop based on misperception. So your values become what you think your values are going to become, or they move away from what you think your values shouldn't be. And that's dangerous. There's no, I'm not saying that there's necessarily this objective universal morality, um, but there's probably something not terribly far from it. There are probably very solid uh, moral truths about what it means to be a human being. And if you're, you know, religious, you probably think that they actually are objective and rooted in God and unchanging and eternal. Uh, I think that they're unchanging because I don't think the species changes that much, uh, frankly, but that's beside the point. He thinks that they're reflexive. And so there's a lot of moral relativism going on in here. And in fact, that he thinks that they are shaped by misperception in feedback loops that actually lend uh, themselves into the chaotic. Okay, so skipping the waffling, he comes in and he says, and I say it goes into the chaotic, uh, and I'm skipping a little bit, so it's going to be a little out of context, but we'll, you'll, you'll pick back up. He says, reflexive processes are bound to lead to excesses. Remember, he's talking about the value formation strategy or processes here. Reflexive processes are bound to lead to excesses, but it is impossible to define what is excessive because in matters of values, there's no such thing as normal. So why does George Soros align with queer theory? Oh, I wonder. Because in the matters of values, there's no such thing as normal. I disagree. Whether you are you believe in objective morals, religiously or otherwise, doesn't matter. I don't think that. I think there are firm objective truths about human beings as as a species, and therefore, uh, it is not, in fact, wrong to say that there are norms governing what it means to be human. In fact. The fact that you can tell that you're a human being and not a chimpanzee in terms of your behavior is in, in what you expect out of people's behavior. Or the reason that we say so-and-so is acting like an animal is because we know that there is a circumscribed line around what it means to be human, uh, which means there are norms, which means that there is some degree of normativity applying to values in an objective sense. I'm not claiming an objective morality that I can articulate and tell you how to be and who to be. I'm saying that there are very likely strong objective facts about what it means to be human from which we derive matters of value. It is not true that there is no such thing as normal, but this puts Soros deep into moral relativistic waters. And in fact, he gets really postmodern with this. He says, perhaps the best way to approach the subject of values is to start from the position that they are rooted in fantasy rather than reality. As a consequence, every set of values has a flaw in it. We can then ask, what are the elements of fantasy in a particular set of values and how the elements of fantasy and reality have interacted? Any other approach would introduce a bias in favor of our own flawed set of values. That's extremely postmodernism, and this is extremely radical moral relativism that Soros accepts as fundamental axioms. I don't actually agree with what he just said. I don't think that values are actually rooted in fantasy. Um, I don't. I mean, it's a very complicated topic. We don't have time for my views on morality. Maybe it's another hour or two hour long podcast someday. 
But I don't think that that's it. But notice how he's saying we can then ask what the elements of fantasy are versus the reality and see how they interact. That means we can start to manipulate through the reflexive process. That's his language to say that we can start to manipulate values using reflexive techniques, which I told you in the outset means perturbing them till things get chaotic and then placing strategic guideposts to lead people to where you want them to go. But that's all based off of a rather radical moral relativism. And that's relevant because it leaves him being opposed to any single people or set of values, for example, the American or the pan-Western values, being hegemonic. He doesn't want a moral hegemony in the world. He doesn't want American or Christian or Western values to have hegemonic status. He doesn't think that there are principles, for example, in the United States that we founded this country on that are true for all people at all times. He thinks that's totally incorrect. This again makes him a natural fellow traveler with the cultural Marxists, particularly the woker ones that started to veer into the postmodern or even people like Adorno and so on who had veered into this negative dialectic that refuses to identify anything as intrinsically superior to anything else. And when I say intrinsically superior, I don't mean in a philosophical a priori before any, I mean that they judge them by their fruits, like some value sets work better than others. And that's not even, it's, we, we pretend that that's a like real question as to whether or not it's true. It's blatantly obvious that it's true that certain value sets work better than others for creating outcomes that raise the standard of living of people. Now, what they would say is, well, that's a value in and of itself. Maybe we shouldn't raise the standard of living. And what I say to that is, shut up. That's ridiculous, because if we aren't raising the standard of living, what we're doing is stagnating or making people's lives worse. Those are the options. So we're going to be content with the level of misery now, or we're going to make there be more misery. Raising the standard of living doesn't mean just having more stuff and more gadgets. It means curing cancers. It means giving people opportunities to pursue fulfilling activities in their lives and fulfilling opportunities to connect with other people. So like, don't even start with me about this because this is some deep BS and I have no patience left for this, uh, you know, we don't know what values are best approach. Like, no, we really do. Uh, we have some really, we don't know everything, but we have some really keen insights into this. But anyway, he doesn't like the idea of a moral hegemony and thus... He's against any claims of our way is the right way and sees that as being in opposition to a truly open society. So what's he going to do? Of course, he's going to use his reflexive process to modify values where people think that they have the right values. See how it works? And if you're the more disenfranchised you are, the more he's going to leave you alone because you're challenging the power structure that's actually disenfranchising those people. So the whole oppressor versus oppressed structure, he says he's not a Marxist, but the whole oppressor versus oppressed structure is imported this way. Now he goes on to say values are closely associated with the concept of self, a reflexive concept if ever there was one. So who you are is a reflexive concept. What we think of I'm sorry, he says, what we think has a much greater bearing on what we are than on the world. Sorry, I said that all wrong. There's, there's, an, there's intonation to this. He says, what we think has a much greater bearing on what we are than on the world around us. In other words, we, what we think influences our behavior more than it does the outside world, which is not a controversial statement. The Stoics understood that, for example. What we are cannot possibly correspond, he says, to what we think we are. So we can't have an accurate assessment of self at all is what he's saying there, which I don't know that that's correct. But there is a two-way interplay between the two concepts. As we make our way in the world, our sense of self evolves. The relationship between what we think we are and what we are in reality is the key to happiness. In other words, it provides the subjective meaning of life. So um, notice then that what he's saying is that the, the key to happiness, which is the subjective meaning of life, is located in quote, the relationship between what we think we are and what we are in reality. It's not terribly controversial, but it's worth paying attention that that's where he thinks the key to happiness and the subjective meaning of life lie, is in the, the relationship, not the resolution, not the integration of our, of our personality, who we think we are versus who we really are, coming to terms with ourselves and living that way. No, it's actually, the, it's, it's in the relationship. 
It's in the, so it's for him, it's always a moving target. We're always changing. We're always flexible. You have to be not just an open society, but you have to be an open individual. And I agree with Richard Dawkins at some point where he said that you don't want your mind to be so open that your brain falls out. Um, because at that point you'll start to believe in anything. And Soros wants you to be able to believe in anything because that's how his social alchemy works, where he puts down the guideposts and leads you into a new system. But anyway, let's go back to the epilogue, because Soros discloses something very important about himself next, which is frankly surprising that he even put it in print, especially in such a highly circulated book. This book sold a very large number of copies. Um, but we need to put this on the table so we know who we're working with, what we're dealing with, as we prepare to understand his concept of reflexivity and how he applies it. Frankly, basically, straightly, Soros thinks he's a god. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Soros thinks he's a god, and he's relatively miserable when he has to act like he's not a god, or even when he isn't among the truly great in intellectual and practical history. Now, he puts it rather modestly, just to be fair, in the book. I'm going to read through this fairly long, tedious um, paragraph about himself, but he's more explicit in an interview he gave a decade later that I'm going to also show you. But he says, this is Soros, I could readily provide a reflexive interpretation of my own development, but I am reluctant to do so because it would be too revealing, not to say incriminating. It will come as no surprise to the reader when I admit that I have always harbored an exaggerated view of my self-importance. To put it bluntly, I fancied myself as a, as a kind of god or economic reformer like Keynes with his general theory, theory or even better, a scientist like Einstein. Reflexivity sounds like relativity. So he wants to see himself as important as John Maynard Keynes or as Albert Einstein. Meanwhile, he explicitly says, to put it bluntly, I fancied myself as some kind of god. It's very important to realize that that's who he thinks he is. That's why he can justify manipulating societies or entire economies to achieve ends in line with his desires, because he fancies himself as some kind of a god, or at a minimum, as a historical figure. It's a very Hegelian concept. He views himself as a man of destiny, somebody who's going to be revered for the gigantic contributions and changes he brought to the world. He says, my sense of reality was strong enough to make me realize that these expectations were excessive, and I kept them hidden as a guilty secret. So he didn't abandon the idea that he's not a god. Remember that he said that the key to happiness, by the way, just a second ago, this meaning of life lies in the, the, the difference between who you think you are and who you really are? This is because he felt miserable that he couldn't act out his fantasies of being a god. And he kept them hidden as a guilty secret because he knew it would be bad if he went around as a megalomaniac. This was a source, he said, of considerable unhappiness through much of my adult life. Okay, so that explains his so-called philosophy before. Nietzsche wasn't right about a lot, and this statement turns out to be reflexive to Nietzsche because it applies to him. But Nietzsche said that very rarely do the philosophers do philosophy. Very frequently, they rationalize their own pathologies. George Soros's philosophy turns out to be a rationalization of his God complex, his raging, overwhelming narcissism and accompanying entitlement complex that he gets to decide how he's going to order society for everybody else because he knows better. Anyway, this was a source that he couldn't be a God, that he couldn't act like the God he believed himself to be, I should say was a source of considerable unhappiness through much of my adult life. As I made my way in the world, reality came close enough to my fantasy to allow me to admit my secret, at least to myself. He could whisper to himself, yeah, I'm really a god, but nobody has to, we just can't tell other people. Needless to say, I feel much happier as a result. Well, how, how in the world would he come to start admitting that he's a god? Because he starts manipulating things and he's starting to create kind of like godlike level changes in society. He's manipulating entire societies. He's manipulating entire economies. And he's like, oh, maybe I really am a god. If we were taking a religious look at this, we're already able to diagnose 100% absolutely clearly that the Chinese are right. George Soros is a demon or possessed by one. But anyway, he started to admit his secret fantasy, at least to himself. And needless to say, I feel much happier as a result. I have been fortunate enough to be able to act out some of my fantasies. Remember, that's being a god. 
This book in particular fills me with a great sense of accomplishment. Reality falls far short of my expectations. You remember when in the past where I told you that I thought that the Gnostic disposition is just generally dissatisfaction with reality, that reality is not as cool as your imagination, so reality must suck and there must be a higher realm that's based on what you can imagine, a weird intellectual narcissism? Well, there you go. Reality falls far short of my expectations, as the reader can readily observe, but I no longer need to harbor a sense of guilt. In other words, he's accepted that he gets to act like a god and gets to believe it for himself. He says, writing this book, and especially these lines, exposes me in a way I never dared to expose myself before, but I can fe- but I feel I can afford it. My success in business protects me. So I can tell you I'm a megalomaniac who believes I'm a god because I'm filthy rich, is what he's actually saying right there. I am free to explore my abilities to their limits exactly because I do not know where those limits are. Criticism, he says, will help me in this endeavor, so he's warm to the critical process. The only thing that could hurt me is if my success encouraged me to return to my childhood fantasies of omnipotence. But that is not likely to happen as long as I'm engaged in the financial markets because they constantly remind me of my limitations. So Soros doesn't know where his limitations are. He suspects maybe he doesn't have any, but he can't predict the market. He can't read the mind of the market in the subtitle perfectly. So he doesn't go to his his childhood fantasies that he grew up with of being omnipotent, all-powerful. He says, given my personality, I've been extremely lucky in my career choice, but of course it was not really a choice, but a reflexive process in the course of which both my career and my sense of self evolved in tandem. I could say a lot more on the subject, But as long as I have a career in business, I have to plead the Fifth Amendment. There is a point beyond which self-revelation can be damaging, and one of the flaws in my character, which I have not fully fathomed, is the urge to reveal myself. That's actually, by the way, a trait of uh, psychopathy. Perhaps I was exaggerating a minute ago when I said I am not afraid of exposing myself. So he says, I'm a god. I'm afraid that I have no limitations, but I keep not being able to achieve everything that I want. So I have to re- a reminder of my limitations. And that's lucky because it keeps me from falling back into my childhood fantasies of omnipotence, um, which is pretty satanic to believe about yourself. Uh, and then he says, and there's something worse, and I'm not even going to tell you what it is. So... Um, I'm going to take the religious route, and I'm just going to say that the Chinese are right. The dude's a demon. So George Soros is a demon. I've said it too. Okay. And I think we diagnosed it from him. Uh, What suite of narcissistic and other uh, personality disorders or psychopathic disorders that indicates, whatever psychopathologies that indicates, is beyond my scope. But I'm sure we could spend a good amount of time in the older DSM and figure out what they are if we really wanted to. Um, So this isn't like a quirk that he put in his magnum opus. In an interview he gave the LA Times in 2004, 12 years later, he says it uh, again very explicitly. This is quoting from an article in the LA Times, which quotes Soros a lot, which is going to be a little bit complicated to communicate to you, but I'll, I'll read from this article in the LA Times, which also refers to George Soros as a god carrying around a lot of demons. Um, in the headline, something, I don't have the headline in front of me, but it was something to that effect. And he says, uh, the, the article says, his motto, quote, if I spend enough, I will make it right, is the essence of his articulated ideas about changing society. Well, that explains his behavior a lot, doesn't it? He thinks he knows what right is, and if he spends enough money, he can make the world right. Part of the reason conservatives lose is we don't have that attitude because we're not weirdo, psychopathic megalomaniacs very often. Uh, But anyway, the article goes on to say, It seems that Soros believes he was anointed by God. Quote, I fancied myself as some kind of God, he once wrote. Well, we just read where he wrote that. He wrote that in the Alchemy of Finance, in the epilogue. Quote, If truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me from childhood, which I felt I had to control, otherwise they might get me in trouble. End quote. That turns out not to be an Alchemy of Finance, as that's part of the further revelation that he um, left out. So it's not just that he has this raging narcissism, God complex, entitlement complex. He also had, and I've said this about these elites many times, he had potent messianic fantasies. They see themselves as the saviors of a fallen world. This is, it's Lucifer. (laughs) It's really his Lucifer. 
And he said he had potent messianic fantasies from childhood, which he felt he had to control. Otherwise, they might get him into trouble. Back in the article, it says, when asked by Britain's independent newspaper to elaborate on that passage, Soros said, quote, It is a sort of disease when you consider yourself some kind of God, the creator of everything. So that's a lot more uh, that he's saying there. But I feel comfortable about it now since I began to live it out. So he says that he was a God and he is comfortable with that idea now because he's living it out intentionally. That meshes with what he said in the Alchemy of Finance. Uh, the article continues, since I began to live it out, those unfamiliar with Soros would probably dismiss the statement out of hand. But for those who have followed his career and socio-political endeavors, it cannot be taken quite so lightly. So Soros has a messianic God complex, and he thinks he has the right and the duty to shape societies by spending lots and lots of money and other things to quote, make it right. Because he thinks he knows what society is supposed to look like, the open society. And he has the right to tweak it, to move people through manipulative means if necessary. And he's usurping the power of, as he even says, the creator of everything. The only self-awareness that he has in this entire thing, besides admitting that those are his fantasies, is that he recognizes that it's some sort of a disease. Now, further down in the article, it says, despite his reputation as an international philanthropist, Soros remains candid about his true charitable tendencies. Quote, I am sort of a deus ex machina, Soros told the New York Times in 1994. Quote, I am something unnatural. I'm very comfortable with my public persona because it is one I have created for myself. It represents what I like to be as distinct from what I really am. You know, in my personal capacity, I'm not actually a selfless philanthropic person. I'm very much self-centered. So he's a narcissist that knows that he has to put on a philanthropic persona. But the way he describes that is being deus ex machina, God from the machine. So what's that mean? That means when things are going in a particular way in a story and you don't know what to resolve, the God in the machine comes down and lifts you out uh, and solves the problem. It's basically Dumbledore appears and solves all of Harry Potter's problems. Is Dumbledore being deus ex machina? Or suddenly, you know, everything's going bad on the Polinor fields and Gandalf shows up and solves all the problems. Same kind of thing. That's how uh, Soros sees himself. And that's how he thinks of his own so-called charitable uh, activities. And the article continues, Soros was more succinct when he explained his life philosophy to biographer Michael Kaufman. Quote, I am kind of a nut who wants to have an impact, he said. But the speculator's visions don't end there. Quote, next to my fantasies about being God, I also have very strong fantasies of being mad. End quote. Soros once confided on British television, quote, in fact, my grandfather was actually paranoid. I have a lot of madness in my family. So far, I have escaped it. He has fantasies not just of being God, but of being crazy. Okay. In his book, Soros on Soros, I'm sure that's a compelling read. He says, quote, I do not accept the rules imposed by others. And in periods of regime change, the normal rules don't apply, end quote. Clearly, Soros considers himself to be someone who is able to determine when the normal rules should and shouldn't apply. That's the end of what I'm going to read out of the LA Times article. I think it's the end of the LA Times article itself. And that's extremely telling about how Soros operates, isn't it? He knows better than all of us because he's a Gnostic, because he's a God complex person who's dissatisfied with life and sees himself as an actual God who's constrained by a society that isn't allowed to live out his God fantasies, or at least not fully. But he gets to determine right and wrong, good and bad for everybody. He gets to determine when the rules should and shouldn't apply, and he gets to manipulate society according to them because, in fact, the normal rules don't apply during periods of regime change. So if you take stable situations and push them to chaotic situations and use them to create what he calls reflexive conditions and use reflexive conditions to throw society into chaos and to direct it toward an operational end and meta system change into something else that you want it to be, the rules don't apply. You can do whatever you want. There is no good or bad. It's all morally relative. The means, uh, the ends, I'm sorry, justify the means. And the means are the reflexive process of social alchemy and manipulation. So this is quite a window into Soros's peculiar character that we have to keep in mind throughout all of this. 
but it's also the definition of his subjective meaning of life. It's actualizing as much of who you imagine you are within the scope of not just who you really are, but what the world will allow you to be. Uh, which imagine if you could change what the world would allow you to be. Imagine if you could change the world and allow it, you know, I imagine myself maybe as trans and I could change the world to accept trans. Well, that's the same mentality right there. But in specific, he characterizes it himself as fantasies of being crazy and that he thinks he's a god who's above the rules who can and should create great historical change um, with messianic fantasies behind it. And that's all according to his own visions, of course. So Soros is a scary character and is very important. But he talked about the subject of meaning of life. Well, what for him is the object of meaning of life? Well, um, it turns out that it's not the biological objective meaning of life, which is to reproduce. It's something else. He says, I also have some views on what could be called the meaning of life in the objective sense, if it were not a contradiction in terms to use the word objective in this context. I start from the position that every human endeavor is flawed. If we were to discard everything that is flawed, there would be nothing left. Sounds a lot like where Goethe said and Marx repeated many times that everything that exists deserves to perish. If we were to discard, but that's not exactly what he's saying. It's the same mentality. So the Marxist and Gertian and critical theory view is everything that exists deserves to perish. So everything that's flawed should be thrown away. But Soros says, no, 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 not that. We get to pick and choose because he's a god. He gets to pick and choose what we're going to keep and what we're going to throw away. Because everything that is flawed, if we threw away everything that is flawed, there'd be nothing left. Now, do bear in mind that the critical theorists and the Marxists in their practice, like Marcuse said that there is a ideal society contained in the present. Well, they alone know what the ideal society looks like, what the liberated society looks like, or at least as close to being able to know what it looks like as possible. So they're the ones who still get to decide what to keep and what to throw away. So it's really not that different. Anyway, Soros is a little more optimistic than there. He says, we must therefore make the most of what we have. Marcuse never expresses anything of the sort. He does say we have to get comfortable with a lower standard of living and that kind of crap, but that is basic needs, but that is not his attitude. He is like, we're not going to be satisfied with anything that we don't like. And here, Soros is the opposite. We therefore must make the most of what we have. The alternative is to embrace death. The choice is a real one because death can be embraced in a number of ways. The pursuit of perfection and eternity in all its manifestations is equivalent to choosing the idea of death over the idea of life. That's a very fancy way of saying P.S. that religion, in fact, uh, the, or at least the uh, Christian religion, is um, because it's a pursuit of eternity, uh, is equivalent to choosing the idea of death over the idea of life. If we carry this line of argumentation to its logical conclusion, the meaning of life consists in the flaws in one's conception and what one does about them. Life, he says, can be seen as a fertile fallacy. Now, that's a term of art, and it gets defined very early in the book, and we're at the very end of the book, so I have to do it separately now. The term fertile fallacy is effectively a lie wrapped in truth, or you could phrase it another way, a truth married to a lie. It is something that isn't true, but that is likely to have people grasp onto and believe it. So in this case, that life is worth living, in other words, there's an objective meaning to life, is itself a fertile fallacy, and it's a lie it's not, life isn't actually meaningless, but we can grasp onto a belief in some kinds of purposes and values and direct ourselves. This is Soros's view of what the meaning of life is. And that means, uh, sorry, that's Soros's view of the objective meaning of life. But this fertile fallacy thing, something that isn't true, but that people will grasp onto and believe means that it's a fallacy that can make change occur. In other words, it's a fallacy, something that's not true, that is, is a vehicle for change. In other words, it's fertile. So a fertile fallacy is a lie people will believe with the result of making change occur. And that's Soros's MO. He even says it's the objective meaning of life. Uh, life itself, or believing in life itself, I guess, is a fertile fallacy. Um, so we see that while Soros isn't quite exactly a nihilist, he's also opposed to any clearly defined utopianism. And he has this sort of you know, wishy-washy, like, let's make the best of it and be very pragmatic and, and, you know, try to live out our fantasies the way that we can. This aligns him again with the general conception of Freire, or Freire, I'm sorry, Adorno and Horkheimer to a degree Marcuse, but Marcuse was a little more hard-ass. 
who believe that history must be allowed to unfold toward greater liberation, Soros' word for that is an open society, without necessarily knowing what that looks like or what it implies. This also puts him more in line with Hegel, who is an idealist, rather than Marx, who is allegedly a materialist, um, which is also consistent with the critical theorists who were more Hegelian than Marx was. Uh, they were actually putting Hegel back into Marx in many regards, but also putting Freud into Marx to make it psychological. Um, the objective meaning for life, then, for Soros, has a great deal to do with being a change agent regarding the flaws in one's conceptions about the world. So in other words, it's kind of closely related to the idealism of Hegel, but combined with the activism of Marx. That is, it's a synthesis of Hegel and Marx, which I think I said is what, in fact, we're dealing with, with cultural Marxism, is you had Hegel and then Marx and the two come together and they synthesize and you get these cultural Marxist or critical Marxist moves that characterize woke, which is a little bit more idealistic, which is how Soros operates. So his alignment with the woke is not surprising at all. And you think, well, what are you saying, James? Is this a wild James Lindsay conclusion? Are you speculating with synthesis, dialectic? Soros didn't say any of that. Well, as it turns out, he does several times explicitly in the book. Um, and we will come back to that. For now, let's finish Soros's thought about uh, the meaning of life. He says, so far, I've spoken mainly in terms of the individual, but the individual does not exist in isolation. His inherently imperfect understanding makes him all the more dependent on the society to which he belongs. The analysis that has led to the concept of re reflexivity also throws some light on the relationship between the individual and society. It is a mistake to think that there are two separate entities involved. The relationship is between a part and a whole. We have seen the cognitive difficulties such that, uh, that such a relationship gives rise to. Neither the individual nor society can be defined without reference to the other. So in other words, there is an intrinsic dialectic for Soros between the individual and society. So defining things just in terms of individual rights wouldn't make any sense because society is part of the individual. So society, if you have individual rights and the society is part of the individual, then that means there must be societal rights somehow apply as well. Oh, so you end up with the group rights, social justice idea out of that. Um, and he has a dialectic of individual versus society. I think that's an incorrect theory of the individual. I think the individual, in fact, can. You can imagine. We saw we had a Tom Hanks movie about it uh, where a guy lived on an island. What was it called? Castaway? He lived on an island by himself for a very long time. Now, there were psychological aspects where he made friends with a volleyball, but that's beside the point. The psychological aspects aside, the point actually is that a single individual can actually navigate his environment without a society. They can figure out how to have food. They can figure out how to keep themselves sheltered. They can figure out how to keep a calendar. They can figure out a lot of things. And they can actually perhaps survive for a very long time. And maybe that life is or is not fulfilling. And that's what kind of what the film explores in certain ways. Soros is saying that's really not true, that that aspect where Tom Hanks' character in the movie makes a friend makes friends with the volleyball, Wilson, I guess is what he calls him because it's a Wilson brand, um, that that's much, much more important and that society is actually inside the man and man is inside a society. Or as I've said in the past, society makes man, man makes society, or society makes man, makes society, makes man, makes society, which is the dialectical wheel of the theology of Marxism. That is, we can see for sure, even without having to read where he explicitly says it, as we will later, that Soros's method is in fact dialectical. And in fact, it's not that far from the dialectical explorations of Marx, who was ultimately asking, where does man come from? And it was that man makes society, but society makes man. A man is a product of his society. He is socialized into it and he is circumscribed by it. That was Marx's hypothesis. He called it the inversion of praxis. But he's also a person who can be historical change agent. In other words, he can do praxis. So praxis leads to the inversion of praxis, which leads to more praxis, which leads to more inversion of praxis. In other words, society makes man, makes society, makes man, makes society. But that's exactly what Soros says. Isn't that crazy? So this is literally the idea that I called the theology of Marxism reproduced uh, at the core of um, Soros's philosophy, which he thinks doesn't have anything to do with Marx. Maybe he actually is very Marxist, but he didn't understand Marx correctly. Uh, I don't know that I figured out Marx better than most people have, but I think I have. And uh, if I'm right, it looks like Soros is just following along in the same mold without knowing what it is. Um, anyway, this dialectic is a hermetic magic trick, which is 
meaning it's based in alchemy, which is why the book is called The Alchemy of Finance. Uh, and it's also the idea, like I said, that's at the core of the theology of Marxism, as I've con uh, characterized it in much detail in the past. Um, it, it, society makes man, makes society, makes man, makes society in an endless wheel. The difference is, is that Marx thought that that trends toward man remembering his true nature as a social being. And Soros thinks it doesn't tend in a specific given direction. It tends toward a society being more open in which is it's like liberated man instead of social man, which puts him in line with the neo-Marxists almost perfectly. So it's not hard at all to guess why Soros jives so well with the woke Marxist theology, which is this woke neo-Marxism, uh, because he lines up with it basically exactly. And he, you can tell he jives with it because he throws tons of money at it to make the changes that it specifically advocates for. He funds it tremendously in all of its dimensions. And the reason is because his thinking is that at the deep philosophical level, I mean, as deep as it goes, how he thinks reality is constructed is actually very similar. It's actually in line with it, if not virtually identical, minus his appreciation for capital uh, and for markets and some limitations on how ruthless he thinks criticisms should be. Now, of course, let me be very clear, Soros does not agree with China. We know that. So there's some ties between woke and China. And we say that I've said many times that the goal of woke is to destabilize society in order to move it to a system that mirrors the Chinese system. Now, he doesn't, Soros does not like the CCP. He does not like the Chinese system. We've been very clear about that already. And so this is where he, like I said earlier, that he's going to start parting ways with his fellow travelers at the World Economic Forum or Larry Fink at BlackRock or whatever, who are trying to force behaviors in particular ways. Soros, in some sense, is a wild card or a joker character in this big picture. He's not in perfect alignment with these other technocrats like like Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and Larry Fink. Uh, he's got a different agenda, and that's because he sees China society and the society that these guys are advocating for at some level as being a closed society, and I'm sure he thinks he can manipulate them into a more open society model, a liberated model. Um, and these differences are pretty consequential. Uh, like I said, the CCP declared him an international terrorist and called him a demon. Uh, so, yeah. Um, what does Soros say about China, though? More specifically, even in the Alchemy of Finance, writing, you know, I would assume he wrote the epilogue to this in 91 or 92. He said, I've just come back from China where the issue is of vital significance. The country has passed through a horrendous period during which the collectivized, the collective terrorized the individual on a massive scale. So that's the Cultural Revolution. He just didn't name it. It is now run by a group of people who had been on the receiving end of the terror. So he's Probably in the early 90s, he might be talking about Deng Xiaoping still, um, but it might have been his successor, which I'm not quite sure on the, the history there. These people have ample reason to be passionately devoted to the cause of individual freedom, but, are, but they are up against a long tradition of feudalism and all pervasive bureaucracy and the constraints of Marxist ideology. I was surprised to find an avid interest in the concept of reflexivity. As I have noted in this book, reflexivity could also be described as a kind of dialectics. Told you. But I have eschewed using that word because of the heavy intellectual baggage it carries. It is exactly these connotations that make the concept so fascinating for the Chinese because it allows them to modify Marxist ideology without breaking with it. Now, this is a place we need to pause because that's really important because if you've been listening to my recent stuff that I've been telling you, I said it on the Joe Rogan podcast, I've put out my own podcast about it. It's a very interesting and telling side story here, uh, breaking away from theor Soros' theoretical speculation specifically. China adopted his reflexive dialectical model specifically in the late 1980s to help facilitate the further installation of what we what I've called in the past productive socialism, which was initiated by Deng, or what I've called even more recently neoliberal communism. It's all just depending on how you want to phrase it. It's basically the same thing. So what I mean is that despite Soros' overwhelming disagreements with China because of it being a closed society, his reflexive dialectic is immediately relevant to the system in China. That is also the model for the, the, the new system intended for the whole world. So Soros would have to think it's being used incorrectly with a predetermined endpoint in mind 
and that's going to be the basis of any disagreements that he has with the World Economic Forum. His disagreements with the CCP are much more substantive, uh, substantive. Sorry, but the point here is the China modified Marxism using Soros's concept of reflexivity to update the dialectical methods, and that's why it's so important to look at how the, the reflexive method works. It, he, I guess Soros would assume they're, he, that they're using in China, they're using, uh, and the People's Republic of China should be very clear, that they're using these methods, the reflexive method, to do evil, to take people in a desired direction toward a closed society rather than toward this kind of fantasy of an open society. But nonetheless, it's his methods that make the engine run. It's his methods that are being also utilized in the West to move us to a similar system, even if he doesn't agree with the idea that the people who are really in charge are not fanciful utopians. They have a very specific system that puts them in power uh, over everybody, and they're all using it. So what does Soros say to explain this? Why does the Chinese like the system of dialectics that he put forth, or reflexivity as a dialectic? He says, well, Hegel propounded a dialect of, dialectic of ideas. Marx turned the idea on its head and espoused dialectical materialism. Now there's a new dialectic that connects the participants' thinking with the events in which they participate. That is, it operates between ideas and material conditions. If Hegel's concept was the thesis and Marxism is the antithesis, reflexivity is the synthesis. That's exactly what I said about the evolution of Marxist thinking in my Theology of Marxism uh, lectures from like two years ago, by the way. But there's a fundamental difference, Soros tells us, between Marxism and the new dialectic. Marx labored under the misapprehension that, in order to be scientific, a theory had to determine the future course of history. The new dialectic is emphatically not deterministic. Since the shape of society cannot be scientifically determined, it must be left to the participants to decide their own form of organization. That's his definition of open society. Since no participant, he says, has a monopoly on truth, the best arrangement allows for a critical process, there's your critical theory, in which the conflicting views can be freely debated and eventually tested against reality. But there he's trying to mix it with actual scientific and reason, uh, and reason like in the liberal tradition. Democratic elections provide such a form in politics, and the market mechanism provides one in economics. That he's actually correct about in both cases. Neither markets nor elections constitute an objective criterion, only an expression of the prevailing bias. But that is the best available in an imperfect world. Thus, the concept of reflexivity leads directly to the concept of an open society, hence its charm in contemporary China. You got you got schooled, George. That is not why they liked it. They liked it because they could update Marxism to make money. As far as I'm concerned, it completes what Hofstadter would call a recursive loop between my concept of reflexivity, my interest in financial markets, and my devotion to the ideal of an open society. I'm just going to reiterate that that's a liberationist fantasy that's not real. But anyway, so... Uh, that's the end of the epilogue. That's how he finishes the whole book. And now we have the perfect setup to actually discuss the concept of reflexivity because now we understand what in the world his head is, where it, where his head is, and what he intends to do with it, how it works, what it's for. We have a big picture. So now we can get into the nitty gritties of understanding this new dialectic that's a synthesis of Hegel and Marx quite intentionally, uh, as Soros put it out. And to understand reflexivity and the thought process Soros has put behind it, we're going to turn to the introduction and first chapter of this book. Um, this is going to be so long. So in the interest of time and in the interest, um, since a lot of the, another interest is that a lot of this book is not very interesting. Uh, frankly, it's a lot of waffle. Like I said, we're going to, we're going to constrain ourselves to those two chapters for now. And we're going to kind of just cover bits and pieces that, that lead up to the points that I feel need to be made so we can understand Soros's methodology properly. We understand his intentions now. Let's understand his methodology. A few paragraphs into the introduction, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're going to start a few paragraphs in. Um, and in fact, what you're going to find out if you're following or if you have a copy of the book and you're following along, I'm going to be a little further down and then I'm going to go backwards and then I'm going to come back forward in the introduction. So if you're looking for it, it's a few pages in. Um, what Soro says is, if I had to sum up my practical skills, I would use one word, survival. 
When I was an adolescent, the Second World War gave me a lesson that I have never forgotten. I was fortunate enough to have a father who was highly skilled in the art of survival, having lived through the Russian Revolution as an escaped prisoner of war. Under his tutelage, the Second World War served as an advanced course at a tender age. As the reader shall see, the investment vehicle I created a quarter of a century later drew heavily on skills I learned as an adolescent. Okay, we've got to do a little more Sor Soros character diving because before we get into the meat of reflexivity, because we've got to talk about this. Because that's a really cute paragraph to describe what he's talking about, uh, if you know the relevant history. What was Soros doing in World War II? Well, Soros, his real last name, or original last name, I suppose, was Schwartz, is Jewish. And his father, Tividar, was also Jewish. And his survival skills father, because of the Nazis, so this is totally um, toward, it's not, it's not an inappropriate thing to have had to happen, changed their last name to Soros, which is a word in Esperanto. Uh, and they actually pretended to be Christian, and they got papers proving that they were Christian, even though they were Jewish. So he changed their last name and got papers proving they were Christian. So there's a mismatch between his identity and the perception of his identity and his real identity, right? And so this, remember, everything he picked up doing what I'm about to describe uh, is what he used to formulate his, his concepts um, for the investment vehicle, which is a reflexive model. Okay, so they pretended to be Christian, changed their name, and he was roughly approximately adopted or made the unofficial godson of a government official in the Hungarian government. Uh, and the Hungarians at the time were complying with the Nazis, and it was this guy's job to go and confiscate Jewish property. So here you have Jewish George Soros being adopted for his own survival and protection by a, Hungar a compliant Hungarian government official whose job it is to round up Jewish property and take it away from them. And Soros was, in some sense, his helper. And so in a famous 60 Minutes interview that was done in 1998, Soros got kind of challenged on this. And he related that in that interview that, in fact, he did go around with his um, approximate godfather, government official, and he did profess his false Christian identity while the man would confiscate Jewish property on behalf of Nazi orders. And he stood as a bystander to those events. But he also said that he didn't participate directly in the confiscation of property himself. So he was a Jewish person watching his other Jewish people have their property confiscated while he pretended to be a Christian. And because he didn't participate in taking their property, he excused himself uh, from the moral crime of being a bystander because he was busy surviving. Uh, so there's a lot of betrayal going on there, uh, but he he thinks it's okay. And when I say he thinks it's okay, I mean he really thinks it's okay because he related in the interview that he has absolutely no remorse about his level of participation in any of this. I mean, it's very clear that he says th that he had no remorse in the interview. Um, and he's been resoundingly criticized for this, uh, perhaps as even being soulless. I think the Chinese called him a demon. And here we can kind of see why. Not only is he remorseless about his participation in these activities during World War II, pretending to be Christian with a false name while he was an assistant to a guy whose job it was to collect Jewish property and seize it for the Nazis, uh, which means he helped. He, I don't know if he scouted people out. I don't know what he did. There are some stories as he's related where he would, you know, tell people ahead of time to, to get out of the way or hide things or don't comply with this or that. But at the same time, he had his practical surviving skills um, that he would later learn to apply to the market to get rich. And the lesson that he drew is that outcomes are more dependent upon perceptions than they are about facts. That's very important. And it's at the center of ref reflexivity. We can talk about if he's a good guy or a bad guy in relation to that, but the lesson was that outcomes are more dependent upon people's perceptions than they are on facts, which in practice means if you can screw with people's perceptions, you can lead them in places you want them to go, if you're good at it at least. Remember the whole thing's called the alchemy of finance? Uh, well, it would also be the alchemy of social science. It would also be the alchemy of historical change. Um, and so here's how he spells out some of these ideas in the book that were that he developed out of this um, realization of perception versus reality. 
so we're pack, backtracking a page and a half or so in the book if you're following along. Uh, he says, I was greatly influenced at the time by Karl Popper's ideas on scientific method. I accepted most of his views with one major exception. He argued in favor of what he called unity of method. That is, the methods and criteria that apply to the study of natural phenomena also apply to the study of social events. I felt that there was a fundamental difference between the two. The events studied by the social scientists have thinking participants. Natural phenomena do not. The participants' thinking creates problems that have no counterpart in natural science. The closest analogies in quantum physics, where scientific observation gives rise to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but in social events, it is the participant's thinking that is responsible for the element of uncertainty, not the outside observer. Natural science, he says, studies events that consist of a sequence of facts. When the events have thinking participants, the subject matter is no longer confined to facts, but also the, per the participants' perceptions. The chain of causation does not lead directly from fact to fact, but from fact to perception, and from perception to fact. This would not create any insuperable difficulties if there was uh, some kind of correspondence or equivalence between facts and perceptions. Unfortunately, that is impossible, because the participants' perceptions do not relate to facts, but to a situation that is contingent on their own perceptions and therefore cannot be treated as a fact. So he says that, in fact, people don't act on facts, they act on their perceptions of facts. As he says, facts lead to perceptions, and then perceptions lead to new facts, which are new states of the world. But those are assessed as perceptions again, and the process repeats over and over and over again. And the fact is that he says there's not a correspondence between what people perceive and the facts which seems to be a strong overstatement of how much bias there is, but to, a, he says, a situation that is contingent on their own perceptions. So people's perceptions are based on people's perceptions. They're not based on the facts of the world, which kind of overwhelmingly says that when we're looking at social phenomena, we can't kind of boil it down and do the observational study, which I think some rigorous social scientists would have a hard time with, the way that we say could boil it down and agree upon the facts, you know, describing a rock or a tree or something like that, in the, or a proton in the natural world. He says, economic theory tries to sidestep the issue by introducing the assumption of rational behavior. So economic theory, in fact, does presume that people can be rational. Uh, he overstates it by saying that it assumes that people are perfectly rational, and we all know those libertarians, and we know that that's not correct. But at any rate, uh, he says that economic theory is wrong because it assumes rationality. So this is a this alchemy of finance is a robust attack also on the rational tradition at the heart of classical liberalism. So to characterize Soros, even though he's already admitted he's a dialectical character, means not classical liberal, uh, as a classical liberal or in line with classical liberalism would be dead wrong. The dude's a leftist. He says, people are assumed to act by choosing the best of the available alternatives, but somehow the distinction between perceived alternatives and facts is assumed away. The result is a theoretical construction of great elegance that resembles natural science but does not resemble reality. It relates to an ideal world in which participants act on the basis of perfect knowledge, and it produces a theoretical equilibrium in which the allocation of resources is at an optimum. It has little relevance to the real world in which people act on the basis of imperfect understanding and in which equilibrium is beyond reach. So this is where he goes on to introduce the concept of reflexivity. He says, I developed my own peculiar approach to investing, which was at loggerheads with the prevailing wisdom. The generally accepted view is that markets are always right. That is, market prices tend to discount future developments accurately even when it is unclear what those developments are. I start with the opposite point of view. I believe that market prices are always wrong in the sense that they present a biased view of the future. In other words, he thinks that market prices reflect what people think the, the value of the thing in the market will be later. But distortion, he says, works in both directions. Not only do market participants operate with a bias, but their bias can also influence the course of events. This may create the impression that markets anticipate future developments accurately, but in fact it is not present expectations that correspond to future events, 
but future events that are shaped by present expectations. The participants' perceptions are inherently flawed, and there is a two-way connection between flawed perceptions and the actual course of events, which results in a lack of correspondence between the two. I call this two-way connection reflexivity. As far as I can tell, this is not the best way to explain re reflexivity. In fact, the two-way bias thing seems like a particularly bad way to put it that comes from his financial thinking about how prices may or may not anticipate future behavior or discount prices. A simpler way to put it would be that our beliefs about the future, right or wrong, are among the inputs that determine the future. That's a much simpler way to put it. If we believe something's going to be true, then we might make it true. If we believe something's going to be false, then we might make it false. In other words, Soros' great idea is that markets and social circumstances operate according to the rules of dynamic systems governed by coupled differential equations, and he seems to lack the mathematics to express it that way. So he has this great insight, really. His great insight is that people can be wrong. It really is. It's people can be wrong, and other people can act on wrong behavior too, and then things that are wrong can happen because people were wrong. Soros, in fact, goes further and believes that we're always wrong, though which is actually of some importance because it means he thinks we're always creating the future out of beliefs about both the future and the present that are in fact not just biased, as he calls it, but also wrong. One of the ways he explains this sounds a lot like the whole dialectical process of either Hegel or Marx, is that we're always making mistakes and then we're correcting according to them or losing control of them. More pertinently, though, it isn't said here explicitly yet, but it comes up later. Soros's idea of reflexivity contains the idea of feedback loops and perceptions, in other words, chaotic circumstances, creating future reality. That is, he believes that our incorrect beliefs can run away and spill over into historical change. And that's, in fact, how he defines historical change, is when these feedback loops spill over based on incorrect beliefs, creating more incorrect beliefs, going and people acting on them, and then boom, you end up in a completely different system. So within much waffling, as an aside, uh, another character-related piece to bring up here, uh, he says, related to this attitude, he says, when I asserted that markets are always biased, I was giving an expression to a deeply felt attitude. I had a very low regard for the sagacity of professional investors. Of course he did, because he th thinks he's smarter than everybody else, because he thinks he's a god, right? And the more influential their position, the less I consider them capable of making the right decisions. My partner and I took a malicious pleasure in making money by selling short stocks that were institutional favorites. Okay, so not only does he have no remorse for doing evil, but he has malice. These are his survival skills. But reflexivity helped him to be able to win a lot of big, short bets against institutional favorites. So this is not irrelevant, because consider... It, uh, you know, it's famous that he did this against the pound sterling. He shorted the, the British pound and made buku bucks. And he thinks he prevented a recession because he's a messiah that came in deus ex machina and saved them from a currency bubble. He, he actually thinks that. He explains it that way. But in reality, he kind of crashed the British economy and made a bunch of money off of it. And he used reflexive methods to do it. But at any rate, consider this outside of the financial domain and in the socio-political domain or the societal domain. The United States and other Western nations are institutional favorites. They are the global dominance. So Soros would take a malicious pleasure in profiting in one way or another by shorting the U.S. and the other Western nations. And wouldn't he? That's what he just said, that he and his partners took a certain malicious pleasure in shorting institutional favorites. So you here you have the big the big big guy on the block, the United States, and he would take a certain malicious pleasure in being the guy who said, huh, I was able to short the whole United States and all of the Western world. In other words, I could collapse that thing while arranging it that I'm gonna make a profit off of it or get what I want out of it in the process. And isn't that what he's doing in a very real sense? It is. That's exactly what he's doing. So the question then is, how in the world do you take institutional favorites, these powerhouse investments, so to speak, and win by shorting them? Things that you think are supposed to keep growing and being strong, but you're going to bet that they're massively overvalued. Oh, but the difference is not, it's not about fact. It's about perception. So if you can get people to perceive that it's overvalued, then they'll act as though it's overvalued and then they'll crash it and you can short it. Oh, so if you can convince people that America is 
you know, got this really great reputation, really great history, really great opportunity, land of opportunity, home of the free because of the brave, the whole, you can get them all whipped up on that and say, guess what? You know what? That's all fake. You should read Howard Zinn about how terrible America is. And you can get people to believe that America kind of sucks. Wow. You could short America. And what kind of stuff does he fund? Critical race theory, critical queer theory, saying this society is not for us. This society is not for us. It's for this people, but not these people. Let's bring in a whole bunch of criminal aliens across the border and say, they're people too. But the society says that they're not citizens they're undocumented citizens now, so it's not for them. Oh my gosh, you could sh- you could make people believe that the U.S. sucks, and you could short the whole country. So everything I want to tell you about Soros and reflexivity is wrapped up in this. And this is his magic trick, and this magic trick keeps happening. We keep falling for it. We keep falling into the reflexive potential traps he sets. I've talked about reflexive potential in other podcasts, much shorter ones. If we this year is going to be a major inflection point in history for civilization, one way or the other, and it is very important, very, very important that we are ready and able to understand the magic trick that's going to distort our perceptions, how it's done, why it's done, and where it's trying to take us so that we can hopefully stop it. So that's why I'm actually making this podcast. Um, We need to understand both the point and the power and the fruit of the reflexive technique that Soros describes. And to do that, we need to understand that it is a yet another hermetic or what a dialectical reflexive magic trick so that when we encounter it, we can name the dynamic and let it fall flat. Then it won't take us where Soros wants us to go when it happens. And we can also convince people that there's a purpose to him funding DA races. There's a purpose to him funding the stuff across the border. There's a purpose to him funding all these chaos, uh, the chaotic elements of, of critical theories and, and, and whatnot. And we can start to reject them because we can see the malicious intent is to short the Western world, in particular to short the U.S. for his own profit. And I don't mean financial profit here. But imagine if he's going to profit off of the creation, if he's positioned himself to profit. I know he's about to die, but his son, if they've positioned himself to profit off of the creation of a global currency in 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 an international central bank. Just imagine. Um, So now we'll skip down a few more paragraphs and move further in the direction of understanding Soros. He says, the more successful I had been in applying my ideas in financial markets, the keener I became to express them in theoretical form. I continued to cherish the fantasy that the concept of reflexivity constitutes a major contribution to our understanding of the world in which we live. I believed that the participant's bias is the key to understanding all historical processes that have thinking participants, just as genetic mutation is the key to biological evolution, but a satisfactory formulation of the theory of reflexivity continued to elude me. Now here, there's a couple of things to catch. There are two things, and I want to... I want to talk about the first one, right? I continue to cherish the fantasy that the concept of reflexivity constitutes a major contribution, right? He thinks everything works reflexively. Stop and pause and appreciate that. He also wanted to be considered a major figure like Einstein or John Maynard Keynes. So he invents reflexivity, hopes that's the contribution. So he, because he thinks things work reflexively, because he's dialectical in his thinking, and everything's dialectical, allegedly, or everything is reflexive in this case, He's going to work really hard to make reflexivity be the thing, the way that everybody understands it. It's this typical wizardry trick. The wizardry is true because the wizardry works, because the people believe the wizardry works, even though the wizardry doesn't work and it all collapses later. It's just like uh, any other, um, you know, multi, multi-level multi marketing scam or whatever. Uh, the, the, these things are all cult scams. Um, so that's the first thing that... He wants reflexivity to be a big deal, so he's working really hard to make reflexivity be a big deal by using reflexivity to make reflexivity a big deal, which is exactly like how all the dialectical thinkers want dialectics to be true, so they work really hard to make dialectical or dialectics to be true by using dialectical methods on people who are susceptible to them because they can't recognize them. In other words, it's it's pulling a magic trick. It's imagining that I'm holding up the queen of hearts and taking a $20 bill out of your wallet somehow. And you don't know the magic trick, which isn't just lame, but it's outright theft. If, uh, you know, the, if you can see the trick. And so that's the goal of understanding reflexivity is we understand the magic trick. We're not going to fall for it. Now, the other point is more subtle, but I want you to catch it. He said the participants bias is the key to an understanding of all historical processes that have thinking participants. 
So I don't want to give away the whole point, although I did at the beginning too quickly here, but it's this. Soros realizes something very important, and I want you to take this in. Get ready. Soros realizes that he who controls the biases of the people controls the future. Not he who can relate the best facts, he who can understand the world the best, who he can articulate facts the best. That's not who controls the future. Soros realizes it is he who controls the biases of the people is who controls the future. Okay, so that's really important. But let's carry on. It's tangential to read it all here. I just want to talk about something because it's going to come up later about why he wants to short America and how it's structured. But there's a big, long piece of substance that comes next throughout most of the rest of the introduction where Soros is talking about uh, the history of financial markets um, and the he, he wants to talk about, as I mentioned before, that the history really needs to be understood in terms of boom and busts preceding a cycle, so the so-called boom-bust cycle of the market. And of course, generally speaking, what he's putting out is that the bigger the, the boom, the bigger the unhappy, in his words, bust that follows it. And he seems to think that, that in fact, there was a huge credit boom that happened during the 1970s and since that should have produced, in his words, a very unhappy uh, financial bust that never arrived. I don't know if 2008 changed that. This is obviously written long after 2000 or long before 2008, but maybe not. So he thinks there should have been it. There was a huge amount of of market bubble through the 1970s through a credit boom, and there was no accompanying market crash, no big recession, no big depression or whatever that should have corrected for it. And so we're in a hugely artificial state of economics and have been ever since really uh, at least the 1970s, but maybe completely after World War II. And this resulting state that we're in of avoiding the inevitable bust that he said must happen, uh, he calls the golden age of capitalism with some self-aware irony. And we're not going to get into the whole weeds, but it's it's more to understand Soros' mentality and disposition and to introduce a couple of other uh, key concepts that are going to matter later. Um, like, what am I talking about? Well, at other points in the book, he talks about uh, how and how and what he did with his manipulation, speci- specifically in shorting the pound, which I mentioned to you before, and that's what he's most infamous for. Uh, what he what he believes that he is doing is correcting market errors sooner than their natural uh, collapses. And so he sees himself, again, those messianic fantasies as a kind of financial hero who was rightfully making lots of money by shorting institutional favorites that were actually artificially institutional favorites and on a crash course with a big crash. But as I told you before, part of his MO is actually to create the conditions where the crash is coming and then say, oh, well, it was always going to be there. So Soros sees our entire system, he calls it the imperial circle, at least post-1970s, maybe post-World War II, as a kind of fake economy that is perilously barely avoiding an inevitable huge financial crash. Now, maybe he's right about that, but that's not the point, because the point is that he thinks he can save the world by inducing it and using his little shorting technique. He always has seen his shorting work as a way to profit off of controlled crashes that take the pressure out of the pot, so to speak. So he sees this huge fantasy economy that we're in as based on a strong U.S. dollar, he says that explicitly, and the U.S. operating as the borrower of last resort. So those two things are a huge problem. So what do you have to do? You have to destroy the dollar. The United States in particular, for Soros, represents a very particular kind of problem, and he calls it the imperial circle. What does he say about this imperial circle, which was in, introduced by these policies, but primarily by the Reagan administration and the neoconservative movement, is that it's a benign circle at the center and a vicious circle at the periphery. In other words, it's good if you live inside of it, but if you get out near the edges, it's actually terrible. It's very exploitative. It's oppressive. In other words, it doesn't create a global open society. It creates a global oppression system, which is exactly what we see him attacking the U.S. for. Now, I don't want to read too much into this discussion because I want to talk about reflexivity. It was just too pertinent to skip. Um, I'll read the kind of key paragraph of this discussion and then move on uh, and talk about reflexivity in the first chapter. Um, So here's what, here's kind of the big takeaway of what I just 
kind of badly described. He says, I try to trace the unique path that events have taken. The preservation of the accumulated burden of bad international debt through the formation of what I call the collective system of lending and the emergence of the United States government as the borrower of last resort. Both of these are unprecedented developments. They gave rise to this strange constellation that I have called the Imperial Circle, a benign circle at the center and a vicious circle at the periphery of a worldwide system based on a strong dollar, a strong U.S. economy, a growing budget deficit, a growing trade deficit, and high real interest rates. The Imperial Circle held the international economic and financial system together, but it was inherently unstable because the strong dollar and high real interest rates were bound to outweigh the stimulating effect of the budget deficit and weaken the U.S. economy. The imperial circle could not last indefinitely. What would happen next? And he said he devoted most of the second half of the 1980s going into the 1990s studying that, and his experiments were roaring successes based on how much money he made in the process. But you can hear the targets of his activism there. There's a benign circle at the center and a vicious circle at the periphery of a worldwide system based on a strong dollar, that's got to go. A strong U.S. economy, that's got to go. Growing budget deficit, growing trade deficit, and high real interest rates. And what that's all got to get replaced with, because it's inherently unstable, right? So he thinks he's about to short that system, that it's all about to crash at some point, and he's going to short it. If you were to crash that system, then you could move in and say, well, that was a big disaster. We can't do that. Let's create an international order with an international central bank that issues an international central currency for the world, ideally and move on. And then we can have a more open society there. Everybody gets to participate in this kind of global EU. But let's rephrase his last question. What would actually happen next, not by just allowing the imperial circle to evolve? What would happen next if Soros was using his reflexivity to short the circumstance and ameliorate the so-called vicious circle at the periphery? In other words, create a more open society around the United States, not just for the United States. Okay. That's I, what I want you to believe is how Soros actually thinks, but put that in your hat for now. Because Soros claimed to be for uh, be investing uh, and getting very rich investing in this way through the latter half of the 1980s going into the 1990s. And a lot of this book, again published in 92, is organized around addressing that particular circumstance, including the policy suggested suggestions we just discussed again, uh, international global central bank that in issues and maintains an international if not global currency with finer regulatory points built in that all depends on his grand open society as an international community. And to get there, I posit that his method is that he is reflexively trying to create the destruction of the Western world, in particular the American hegemony, specifically through reflexive means in order to uh, solve that problem in a way that he profits off of and that leads toward what he believes is the great open society so he can be thought of as a great historical figure who saved the world from itself. And so the first chapter of this book goes into the details of how it works and is titled rather grandiosely the, the theory of reflexivity as though it's like the theory of relativity, again, comparing himself to Einstein kind of tangentially, which I wouldn't bring up except he literally said that already. And it begins with a section called anti-equilibrium, which is important in telling. And here's how it begins. Uh, economic theory is devoted to the study of equilibrium positions. The concept of an equilibrium is very useful. It allows us to force, or sorry, focus on the final outcome rather than on the process that leads up to it. But the concept is also very deceptive. It has the aura of something uh, empirical. Since the adjustment process is supposed to lead to an equilibrium, an equilibrium position seems somehow implicit in our observations. This is not true. So that's a bold statement. Equilibrium, he says, equilibrium itself has rarely been observed in real life market prices, uh, which have a notorious habit of fluctuating. The process that can, that can be observed is supposed to move toward an equilibrium. Why is it that the equilibrium is never reached? It is true that market participants adjust to market prices, but they may be adjusting to constantly moving targets. In that case, calling the participant's behavior an adjustment process may be a misnomer, and equilibrium theory becomes irrelevant to the real world. Well, mathematically speaking, that's not actually true. You actually can have a dynamic system that has a so-called equilibrium where the equilibrium itself is moving, and it kind of moves around 
uh, that equilibrium. All he's saying here, all this complicated shit, all he's really saying here is that two things are happening. Number one, conditions change, so the equilibrium prices move as conditions change, which he thinks is all going to be based on bias and not based on, like, actually shifts in demand or shifts in need or whatever based in, it could be on literally fairly random stuff like the weather, um, literally, or other things, uh, technological development, people, uh, you know, the cities or, or regions developing or kind of collapsing in terms of development. Lots of things are going on even stupid things like fads and things that people want, then so that's one of the two things is that it is a moving target, but that doesn't mean equilibrium theory is wrong. It just means that you're not conceiving of it rightly if you're thinking of a stable, unmoving equilibrium. Uh, so why is equilibrium never reached? Well, you're looking at the wrong thing, George. And then secondly, um, there is a stochastic element. And I'm not really going to get into that, but the market has random fluctuations. Maybe it's the weather. Who knows? I mean, and I mean that kind of seriously, that there are factors going in that create a lot of noise. And when you have a dynamic system, not that I'm an expert in this anymore. I took a 500 level sequence on dynamic systems back in like 2003, four. It's been a long time. I don't really remember the the details. But when you introduce a stochastic variable, in other words, a random, a fluctuating variable, something that's got literally random components in a dynamic system, you end up with some pretty messy behavior. But dynamic systems occasionally tend toward chaotic behavior if the parameters get out of, in, in, within certain ranges. I'm trying to figure out how to explain this without having to go into the whole bifurcation diagram discussion or phase, phase diagram discussion. So basically... If the variable is randomly fluctuating, uh, it could actually randomly fluctuate into chaotic conditions. It could randomly fluctuate into um, you know different positions. So you're not going to see a stable equilibrium, even in the sense of like a single dot or even a stable orbit. You're going to see kind of a wiggly, fuzzy orbit. And then imagine that the wiggly, fuzzy orbit is moving back and forth and around based on how actual conditions in the world are shaping say demand, which is, or, or capacity to supply. Uh, so there are all these, all these factors. It's not all based on bias in other words, but he's saying, why is equilibrium never reached? And his big contribution is because it's all biased. turns out there are other factors. And this is why, first of all, he thinks he's like some kind of super genius and this is the way that it works. And he's like, well, I can't figure out why I can't predict the market perfectly. That reminds me of my limitations. It's because he actually is model. His grand model is not actually correct. The market, the market has perhaps can be manipulated through dialectical methods. I'm sure it can be manipulated. All social phenomena can be manipulated by dialectical methods, but it's not based on dialectical methods. And it's especially not based on dialectical methods alone. This guy's a wizard and he thinks his magic spell is the be all that ends all, but there's a lot of other stuff that he could understand. But I digress. Just saying mathematically, there's a lot here to say about dynamic systems, equilibrium conditions, especially with apparently stochastic elements, uh, whether those are, are truly stochastic or whether they're what's called um, deterministic uh, chaos, which means like when you roll a die, like physics could tell you if you knew all the conditions just right, exactly where the die is going to land. It's just a purely physical process. It's deterministic, but you couldn't predict what's going to happen on the die ahead of time because basically what's happening is that you have, there's so much variability in the initial conditions when you roll the die that you don't know what's going to come up when you let go of the die. So it's called deterministic chaos. It could be some of, it's not true randomness in a sense, but it it could be some of both of these things. I'm not going to bog us all down with any of this. I've already gone too far into bogging down. I'm also not going to go review dynamic systems or stochasticity to the level that I need you to talk about it intelligently. The short version is that equilibria are more complicated than George Soros is making out. And then he's saying, voila, it's reflexive instead. Um, I have a lot of notes about this that I don't even need to talk about. But I will say, at least when there's stochastic variables in a dynamic system you have to add additional inputs to keep things approximately stable. Remember when I did that thing about liberalism with the baseball bat, for those of you that know what I'm talking about, uh, like that, imagine that a society, a liberal, a free society is like holding a bat on the palm of your hand upright. So the bat is sticking up and because a little wiggles in your hand and in the wind or whatever else, the bat is actually going to tip over, but you have to keep moving your hand to keep your hand under the bat to keep it upright. And people who are good at that can do it. And I said that that's the equivalent of the famous, it's a Republic. If you can keep it, 
uh, to keep a free society operating, something that actually is an open society, like what we have when we operate a classical liberal system, to keep that operating, you have to put effort into keeping the thing upright, is what I'm saying, because there are random variables going in, and that can cause a lot of problems, including occasional chaotic circumstances. It's not all reflexive, but you have to make effort to deal with the stochasticity, and we're not going to go any more into that. I just want you to understand the equilibrium conditions are, to Soros, not even real. It's not, he doesn't even think that they're real, and he thinks that the reason is because the entire domain is reflexive rather than um, being uh, just a dynamic system. Now, he did characterize this somewhere in the introduction or the preface, I don't remember where, he actually says that he overfigged this pudding, that he actually thinks that there are reflexive conditions and then there are near equilibrium conditions that actually operate like equilibrium conditions or like classical economics more so, but he doesn't really know the difference. But the difference is, is that the parameters due to random fluctuations or due to manipulation through the dialectical reflexive methods get pushed into the chaotic range of the dynamic systems. I'm just saying that like, if he understood differential equations and dynamic systems, he would actually know what he's talking about here. But his thinking is that if you are thinking in terms of stable dynamics or equilibrium conditions or even kind of homeostatic conditions, ones that tend back toward equilibrium if perturbed away from it, you're thinking all wrong about how the world works. The world isn't based on stability and Soros. The world is based on instability. So instability is key for Soros's ideas about how things work in the real world, in the market, in society, in socio-political uh, systems, historical systems. And so Soros, I guess, rightly questions the fully rationalized economic theory of a kind of naive laissez-faire capitalism. But I like it's like he's going back and criticizing ideas from Adam Smith from like the 18th century. Uh, which is this condition he, I think he over, I mean, I agree. There's no such thing as perfect competition. And like I said earlier, we all know those libertarians. It's not realistic. We don't have the conditions of perfect competition. So markets do not have that. So I agree with Soros says that's not real, but I don't agree with what he does with it. Here's what Soros says. Let's examine the main assumptions of the theory of perfect competition. Those are that, uh, those are, so sorry. Those that are spelled out include perfect knowledge, homogeneous and divisible products, and a large enough number of participants so that no single participant can influence market price. So obviously the last one says why we need to be vigilant about uh, monopoly or even duopoly or even, you know, very uncompetitive markets. And then the big one here, though, is perfect knowledge. I'm not going to worry about homogeneous and divisible products. The fact is, he, he, Soros is not wrong to say we don't have perfect knowledge. He calls that bias, and he basically says that everything's based on bias and is really bothered. So he's not totally wrong, but he's wrong. He's right in the wrong way uh, about the idea of perfect knowledge being a key assumption and, and perfect competition. Perfect competition is kind of like an ideal. We don't have to use it as anything but kind of literally to use his word, a guidepost to do economics work. But nevertheless, he is right that we are lacking some information all the time. And he's right that participants aren't just partially ignorant, but are also biased. People are acting according to their wants and including their hopes of what will happen, for example. And they also, if I put together a really good marketing pitch for a really crappy product, I can trick you. You don't have perfect knowledge. And the, you know, the kind of stupid, naive argument is that, well, with enough time, if a company's cheating you, you'd be able to figure it out. But the thing is that we all have finite time horizons. And so no, actually the corporations can keep the ruse going for a pretty long time. If you don't believe me, look at the behavior of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the real issue for Soros is none of this though. His issue isn't that we lack because we're limited. We lack perfect knowledge. It is in fact that we're limited in a particular way that knowledge can, that perfect knowledge cannot even be had in principle, not because it's beyond the scope of a human being to understand it, but because the situation is reflexive. So when I say they can't have it in principle, it has nothing to do with in practice of being the limits of a human being. He thinks in principle, God could not have a uh, perfect knowledge because it's a reflexive situation. And here's how he summarizes that. He says, buy and sell decisions are based on expectations about future prices, and future prices in turn are contingent on present buy and sell decisions. 
Then I skip quite a lot of waffling, and he says, the demand and supply curves are presented in textbooks as though they were grounded in empirical evidence. But there is scant evidence for independently given demand and supply curves. Anyone who trades in markets where prices are continuously changing knows that participants are very much influenced by market developments. Rising prices often attract buyers and vice versa. How could self-reinforcing trends persist if supply and demand curves were independent of, mar independent of market prices? Yet even a cursory look at commodity stock and currency markets confirms the trend uh, the trends are the rule rather than the exception. So here's his big discovery that supply and it's not just that prices depend as a classical economics, you know, the, the market price is where the, the supply and demand curves intersect. It's not just that it's not that the supply and demand curves determine the price. It's in fact that the price and in fact, expectations about future price can confuse people and get them to act in a way about that. It can make them supply or demand things. If you think like I could make a lot of money, the price is going up for such and such commodity, so I'm going to make it rise the supply because I'm going to go make money off of it. Well, that inf the, the market price influenced your decision to do that, not some demand or capacity to supply. And so what he's saying is that the prices fee or there's a feedback loop there into prices, and this is how people actually work. But the whole point of classical economics is, in fact, this is the adjustment thing is that this usually under most circumstances, and Soros acknowledges this in the preface or whatever, is under most circumstances that these things actually adjust back. If I go start making more of a thing because it's very valuable, then what I do is I increase the supply, which makes the value of it less. So over time, the value comes down so that it turns out the market price finds its approximate equilibrium, which is still moving according to where the supply and demand curves are. He's just saying that people's supply and demand activities are related to what they expect the prices are. It's not just a one-way street. And it's like, this is like, he thinks he's really figured out something special. The reflexive conditions for him are where that's the stuff gets so out of whack that things go into chaotic environments. But um, I really want to hit upon his invocation of self-reinforcing trends as being relevant to his theory of markets and society, not in society and society, his theory of society, of history and historical change, his theory of change, so to speak. This is where reflexivity becomes important for him. But note that in light of what we said before, self-reinforcing trends are actually based on incorrect information that is kind of correct because it is believed and therefore self-manifesting. What in the heck does all that mean? What do I mean? I mean, if people believe the price of a stock is going up, they'll buy more of it, which then drives up its price. If they believe it's going to go down, they'll sell, which drives down its price. When people see other people see these trends, they believe they're seeing something happening. So more people do the same thing, creating a self-reinforcing trend in the market. Some of this might take things toward actual price adjustment. In other words, tending toward equilibrium but they can run away too. That's Soros's whole point and actually take prices far from equilibrium. That is to create a huge distortion in terms, remember when Dogecoin blew up because Elon Musk tweeted about it? They can create a huge distortion in terms of how things are perceived to be valued or what they're worth versus what their actual value is. And this, Soros insists, is what causes the boom bust cycles in markets. And to be fair, this is a fairly sophisticated theory of market behavior. I'm not, I did say he's over figuring the, figuring the pudding and everything, but I'm not really going to crap on it. It is a fairly, fairly sophisticated way of thinking about that particular aspect of market behavior. You, it's like bank runs. If everybody thinks the bank is going to crash and they all go take their money out of the bank, the bank crashes. So they reflexively created it under the panic uh, of the misbelief that the bank will crash. So they need to go get their money before everybody else does. So again, if you were, say, a Soros-style activist, you might convince people that the bank is going to crash so that they go take all their money and then the bank crashes if your goal was to crash the bank for some ex for some reason or another. And that's how his magic spell works. We'll get more. We'll get to that more later. So he spends two really long sections after this discussing the problem of imperfect understanding. I don't mean two paragraphs. Two very long sections discussing the intrinsic nature of the problem of imperfect understanding. Like I said, even God couldn't have perfect understanding because it's a reflexive environment. I'll try to be light with this treatment, but we've got to talk about it because this is where reflexivity really gets described. And the point is that imperfect understanding isn't a state of ignorance or bias. It is a feature of every system that consists of thinking participants. This is his point. 
He says scientific method. He has a very, he doesn't say the scientific method or the scientific methods. He always just says scientific method. He says scientific method is designed to deal with facts. But as, as we have seen, events which have thinking participants do not consist of facts alone. The participant's thinking plays a causal role, yet it does not correspond to the facts for the simple reason that it does not relate to facts. Partic participants have to deal with a situation that is contingent on their own decisions. Their thinking constitutes an indispensable ingredient in that situation. Whether we treat it as a fact of a special kind or something other than a fact, the participant's thinking introduces an element of uncertainty into the subject matter. This element is absent in the natural sciences. Skipping a bit, it is the self-influencing character of the participant's thinking that is responsible for the element of uncertainty or indeterminacy I mentioned before. The difficulties of scientific observation pale into insignificance when compared with the indeterminacy of the subject matter. The indeterminacy would remain even if all the problems related to the observer were resolved. That means even if God were the observer. Whereas the problem of the observer can be directly attributed to the indeterminacy of the subject matter. Thus, the problem of the social sciences is not merely methodological, but is inherent in the subject matter. So he's not talking just about markets anymore. The entirety of the social sciences, he says, can't be scientific. He then goes in, and I have to mention this because um, I have to talk about it a little bit later but I don't want to go into it. So Soros gives a very long and detailed explanation of Popper's theory of science, um, which is called the DN model, uh, and why it applies fairly well to the natural sciences and why it applies very poorly to the social sciences. And, and the, it's actually for the reason I just explained, and it, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. I guess they're actually kind of somewhat interesting if you're under the philosophy of science. They're kind of tediously presented, but if you want, go read the first chapter of Alchemy of Finance and you can see for yourself. It's actually a little bit interesting. Uh, if you're interested in why the social sciences are inherently more challenging uh, in, a, in, a, in a very meaningful way than the natural sciences, I think you would actually find that discussion useful. But I think, again, he goes too reflexive with it. But there is something very important said in all this. He says, social scientists have gone to great lengths to maintain the unity of method, that means that the same methods apply to natural sciences and social sciences, but with remarkably little success. Their endeavors have yield, yielded little more than a parody of natural science. Now, I want to pause here and point out the replicability crisis, the replication crisis, because I think that's part of what's going on. That isn't actually caused by the imprecision or the indeterminacy of social science, that's caused by the ability to lie to peer reviewers and to use bogus methods like p-hacking to get results that you want so that your career can advance. Another thing has more to do with bogus career incentives than it has to do with, with um, the indeterminacy of the social sciences. I'm just going to point that out because I actually am fairly warm to the idea of, of within a circumspect range of scope, I think that there is a, uh, a rigorous social science activity possible. I'm not as dire as the, all of this, but I just want to point that out. He says, they've had little success in the unity of method thing. Their endeavors, uh, endeavors have yielded little more than a parody of natural science. In a sense, the attempt to impose the methods of natural science on social phenomena is comparable to the, uh, the efforts of alchemists who sought to apply the methods of magic to the field of natural science. But while the failure of the alchemists was well-nigh total, social scientists have managed to make a considerable impact on their social matter or their subject matter. Situations which have thinking participants may be impervious to the methods of natural science, but they are susceptible to the methods of alchemy. That wording is very important. I think that the natural science methods actually can work in a, like I said, limited scope in the social sciences. And that recognizing those limitations is actually pretty key to doing rigorous social scientific work. And I don't think most social scientists would disagree with me. I think most of the reason that most social science is crap is not because of inherent limitations that he's talking about, because I think he's a crackpot, but rather because of badly aligned professional incentives that ran amok. But he didn't say that. He said that... Situations which have thinking participants are susceptible to the methods of alchemy. They are 
susceptible. You can intentionally do alchemy to social science. In other words, you can intentionally not do social science in the name of social science. You can do social alchemy. You can try to make lead into gold through misapplication of the social sciences, which is in fact exactly what his reflexive method is and what it's doing. He says, the thinking of participants, exactly because it is not governed by reality, really, is easily influenced by theories. So you can mislead people. In the field of natural phenomena, scientific method is effective only when its theories are valid. But in social, political, and economic matters, theories can be effective without being valid. In other words, they can be operationally useful. Whereas alchemy has failed as a natural science, social science can succeed as alchemy. That is very interesting wording. Social sciences can succeed as alchemy, he insists. But that means to make something that isn't out of what is. That's a heavy point that deserves a whole podcast of its own, that the social sciences can succeed as alchemy. It's not that they are alchemy. They can succeed as alchemy. In other words, you can do bogus social science like nudge theory and achieve results in the world. That's what he's actually saying. But we can understand Soros and his reflexive dialectic here as indicating that he subscribes to sociological Gnosticism. In fact, a hermetic kind of it. That is social science as a form of social wizardry. That is social science as intentional manipulation by those who understand the boundaries of social science. Not only that, though, but this is alchemy, which makes something that isn't from something that is by means of magical processes, which in the social realm means manipulative processes. Think of magic. So I'm not talking about like Gandalf because that's fiction. I'm talking about real magic. You go to a real magic show. You watch a real magician. Did the real magician that you went and watched do real magic? No. So a good definition from a real magician of magic that I saw is where you have cause A leading to effect B, and you have no ability to discern a causal relationship between cause and effect. That's a, you can let that sink in. That's actually a sophisticated definition. But it's, for example, that I put the thing in the cup and I wave my hand in front of the cup, which should do nothing to the thing in the cup. And then the thing inside the cup is gone. So you have the cause A, me waving my hand in front of the cup, and the effect B, the thing inside the cup disappeared. And there's no causal relationship. You can't discern how it happened. Now, of course, there is a causal relationship between the ball leaving the cup. You just don't know what I did because I tricked you which is to say I manipulated you. I had it tucked between a finger or it was a cup with a false bottom or, you know, whatever. It depends on the trick. And there are lots of videos. Go watch your Instagram, look it up on, on your Instagram or whatever, YouTube. There are lots of videos where they show you magic tricks from the magician's perspective. I've watched a ton of them. And when you see it, you're like, uh, social alchemy, which is what he's actually advocating for here as what social science either is or can succeed as, is manipulation. It is deception. It's not real magic. You cannot make an open society out of a real society through a magical alchemical process. Somewhere in there is lying, deception, manipulation. And when you try to do it, it's not a magic trick in a show. You're going to cause massive disasters. This is the same problem all of the other sociological Gnostics that are hermetic in nature, like the Marxists have caused, or the liberationists. It's calamity after calamity after calamity because they're trying to make something that doesn't exist out of something that does exist through deceptive methods. But anyway, later in this book, actually, Soros explains explicitly what he means by alchemy. So let's say in his words instead of mine. It's important to bring it to bear immediately since he's now invoked the word alchemy, which is, of course, in the title. This is how Soros splits the natural and the social sciences, and it's crucially important to understand. He says, scientific method seeks to understand things as they are, while alchemy seeks to bring about a desired state of affairs. So you're not trying to study social phenomena, you're trying to manipulate them. Or the point is not to understand the world, but to change it. The guy says he's not a Marxist. Let's be very clear. To put it another way, the primary objective of science is truth, that of alchemy, 
operational success. So you have an intended state that you want to change the world to, and your goal is to succeed in the operation through alchemical, which is to say manipulative processes. That is reflexivity. That is George Soros's modus operandi. That is alchemy, where social science can actually be considered. So social science is social alchemy in the Soros reflexive or dialectical or Marxist, whichever one you want, method. And what it's about is getting what you want out of the world, no matter what's true. That's Soros's view. It is a purely manipulative theory befitting somebody who literally thinks that they are a god. And you make yourself feel good about it by believing that you're saving the world from itself as a messiah figure. And he's rather explicit, really, about this entire structure, that it's manipulative and the goal is getting what you want out of the world, not just through this operational success line. He says, social phenomena are different. The imperfect understanding of the participant interferes with the proper functioning of the Paparian scientific model. He actually says the DN model, but I'm just doing this so I don't have to explain it. This has far-reaching implications for the conventions of scientific method. It limits the results that can be produced by observing the conventions and, what is worse, it opens the way to attaining worthwhile results by transgressing them. So you don't have to follow valid methods in the social sciences. You should tra transgress legitimate methods in order to achieve what you want. He says, and what is worse, it, oh, sorry, he says there is much to be gained by pretending to abide by the conventions of scientific method without actually doing so. So he's talking about behavior in the social sciences. He says, yeah, try to look scientific. He says there's much to be gained by pretending to be scientific, but you're not actually doing so. You're doing alchemy, pretending to be a scientist. Listen to science, follow the science. Oh my God, the whole COVID thing was a gigantic reflexive environment, wasn't it? Let that pill sink in for a second. Or is it a jab? I guess we got to inject it, right? Natural science, he says, is held in great esteem. A theory that claims to be scientific can influence the gullible public much better than one which is frankly, uh, which that frankly admits its political or ideological bias. Follow the science. Listen to science. The science is settled. He said, a theory that claims to be scientific can influence who? The gullible public much better than one which frankly admits its political or ideological bias. I only need to mention, he says, Marxism and psychoanalysis as typical examples, but laissez-faire capitalism, with its reliance on the theory of perfect competition, is also a case in point. It is noteworthy that both Marx and Freud were vocal in protesting their scientific status and based many of their conclusions on the authority they derive from being, quote, scientific. Once this point sinks in, the very expression social science becomes suspect. It is a magic word employed by social alchemists in their effort to impose their will on their subject matter by incantation. And he just said Marx and Freud are these people. Now hang on. So you think, wow, he just said that's really bad. That's not legitimate. But no, as a matter of fact, he's like, this is how the world works, so that's what we're going to do. That's really important to, 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 to get. He's basically saying people can be manipulated, so we should. The gullible public can be tricked by the appearance of science, so let's do it. In the next section, he lays out his reasoning for this, and it turns out that it's all lying in what he calls the participant's bias. He says, my approach is to tackle the problem of inter imperfect understanding head on. What makes the participant's understanding imperfect is that their thinking affects the situation to which it relates. The causal role played by the participant's thinking has no counterpart in the phenomena studied by the natural scientists. It is obviously not the only force shaping the course of events, but it is a force which is unique to events that have thinking participants. Hence, it deserves to take center stage. So Soros directs attention to the point that what people think is causal in the social, economic, and political worlds. But more accurately, and more to my point, Soros understands that what people can be made to think is therefore causal in determining the future course of events. That is social alchemy. If you can make people believe it, you can make people do it. It's not concerned with truth. It's concerned with operational success. In other words, social alchemy can be used to, quote, bring about a desired state of affairs. 
And he thinks that this is the nature of the social sciences. So if that's what they are, that's how you have to use them. So you might as well. And economics, politics, society, that's all within the realm of the social sciences. And if that's just what governs it, that's what you got to do. So you might as well be advantageous in it. So you might as well manipulate it. Soros uses this to establish and define reflexivity properly, finally. It takes a little bit of technical work on our end so that we can understand his language, so let's just jump into it. The next section is called The Concept of Reflexivity, and it starts out this way. The connection between the participant's thinking and the situation in which they participate can be broken up into two functional relationships. I call the participant's efforts to understand the situation the cognitive or passive function, and the impact of their thinking on the real world in the participate, uh, sorry, the grammar here's a little challenging. So I'm going to actually modify what he wrote to make it more clear. I call the participant's effort to understand the situation, the cognitive or passive function. And I call the impact of their thinking on the real world, the participating or active function. I don't know why he says passive and active, because what he really says is when you try to understand the world, that's the cognitive function. When you try to act in the world, that's the participating function. We could call them theory and praxis, right? In the cognitive function, the participant's perceptions depend on the situation. In the participating function, the situation is influenced by the participant's perceptions. So when I said dynamic systems with coupled equations, that's what I'm talking about. It can be seen that the two functions work in opposite directions. In the cognitive function, this is a very bad way to say that they're coupled equations, by the way. Uh, in the cognitive function, the independent variable is the situation. In the participating function, it is the participant's thinking. But again, this is theory and praxis in that they're reflexive on one another. This guy's just reinventing, you know, the other dialectics and thinking he's got something genius here. There are many cases where one or the other function can be observed in isolation, but there are also instances where they are both operating at the same time. When both functions operate at the same time, they interfere with each other. Functions need an independent variable in order to produce a determinate result. But in this case, the independent variable of one function is the dependent variable of the other. I'm telling you, all he did was invent dynamic systems here and think he's done something really freaking genius. He got, oh, you found out coupled equations exist, did you? Instead of a determinate result, Usually what happens in dynamic systems is that you have a dynamic result, like that the population follows a cyclical, like an orbit, right? So sometimes the population goes up and then they get kind of overstresses the environment and it goes down and then there's not really enough. So there's lots of food or whatever, excess of food. So it goes back up and then it overstresses the environment. So it goes back down and it goes in like a circle of up and down or a sine wave up and down, up and down. It's something that's a very simple example. Oh my gosh. It's so complicated. He says, instead of a determinant result, like a single number, we have an interplay in which both the situation and the participants' views are dependent variables so that an initial change precipitates further changes in both the situation and the participants' views. I call this interaction reflexivity using the French word, sorry, using the word as the French do when they describe a verb whose subject and object are the same. So like I said, he literally just figured out coupled equations and dynamic systems and he's like, ermagerd, because like, he doesn't actually know the math behind what he's doing, but I digress. Here's a simpler articulation of his reflexive thing, because that was technical and weird. I just need this to set up for the determining function and the cognitive, or the participating function and the cogn uh, cognitive function. Reflexive things are things, this is a simple definition. Reflexive things are things that are neither true nor false, but that become true or false based on what people believe about them. That simple. This is a revolutionary moment. Well, if we all believe it is, then it is. It becomes one. And if none of us believe it, nothing happens, and it's definitely not one. If enough people believe a stock is going to crash, people will act in a way that crashes the stock. If enough people believe a bank is going to fail, people will act in a way called running on the bank that causes the bank to fail. If enough people believe that a stock is going to go gangbusters like Dogecoin or even like Bitcoin did for a while, they'll buy in and it'll go gangbusters. For Soros, these states are not reflections of reality itself, but are a kind of self-reinforcing feedback loop caused by misperceptions of reality that cause circumstances that generate more perceptions that cause more circumstances, and so on. In other words, it's sort of like society creates man, creates society, creates man, but it's the circumstances create perceptions, the perceptions create circumstances, and the circumstances create new perceptions, and that creates new circumstances. In fact, they are in his mind. So he thinks that it's a dialectical environment. Basically, when people act in mass formation idiocy, 
he thinks it's a dialectical environment. And so what do dialectical environments produce? People that are acting in mass formation psychosis. Oh, how about that? But the fact is for Soros, this always depends on a inaccurate appraisal of the situation. It's always that it's based on perception and your perceptions are always wrong. Soros then says that this situation can be depicted mathematically. Specifically, he actually shows a pair of coupled functions. He doesn't write them as differential equations, but he actually shows a pair of coupled equations where the input of the cognitive function is itself a function of the participating function, and the input of the participating function is itself a function of the cognitive function. It's a lot of math words. I apologize. That is, the theory function takes practice as an input, and the praxis function takes theory as an input which is exactly like dialectical Marxism and exactly like Hegelian dialectics, just like Soros said about his method in the first place. Now, let me remind you real quick as a tangent here that for Marxists, and Soros says he's not a Marxist, right? But he just uses the same methods, the exact same methods that happen to have kind of an identical conclusion, but not the same way of getting there. The saying is that practice is the criterion of truth. And I've wanted to do a short podcast about that phrase itself, and I haven't done it yet. Practice is the criterion of truth. But what that actually refers to is that theory and practice are unified dialectically. And literally, as Hegel said it, the unification is speculative, which means, in a sense, reflected, because it, when, when, when Hegel says speculate, he's talking about look in a mirror from the Latin speculum, which means mirror. Uh, so it's, it's when, when he says it's a speculative thing, what he's saying is that you're looking at what's happening in the world while you're reflecting not just on your ideas about the world, but what the ideal ideas, the perfect idea might be. And that allows you to refine your ideas about things more toward the platonic ideal. That is, if something, uh, in other words, that is something is true if it works to advance the goals of the theory. And the way that you can tell is you look at the theory and decide whether or not it advanced the goals. And Soros thinks the same way about his own approach. If it works, say if it opens society some more, and he says, that, or if it makes him money in the market, and he says this is the only quasi-objective measuring stick available, by the way, whether or not it works, then it is true within the boundaries of social alchemy. And that's what Soros is trying to describe. Practice is a th criterion of truth. So it doesn't matter if it's true or false. It doesn't matter if it takes you to a state of society that's functional or not. It matters, were you able to move society? That's all he cares about. And if it was, then it must have been right. So it doesn't matter how many misconceptions your historical change is based on. It must have been right if you were able to induce it to happen in the first place. And if it moves you more in the direction of what you think is supposed to be, which he says you're not supposed to know what the direction is, it just has to be open, which means more people get to participate. And I'm telling you, Soros is quite explicit about all this. Here's how he continues. This is the theoretical foundation of my approach, he says. The two recursive functions do not produce an equilibrium, but a never-ending process of change. Remember when Freddie said that the, pro the cultural revolution would be perpetual? The process is fundamentally different from the processes that are studied by the natural science. There, one set of facts follow. See, it's not a traditional theory, it's a critical theory. Uh, there, one set of facts follows another without any interference from thoughts or perceptions, although in quantum physics, observation introduces uncertainty. When a situation has thinking participants, the sequence of events does not lead directly from one set of facts to the next. Rather, it connects facts to perceptions and perceptions to facts in a shoelace pattern. Thus, the concept of reflexivity yields a shoelace theory of history. Or really, a theory of change is how it should be looked at, because it's how you're going to go do change in the world. It must be recognized that the shoelace theory is a kind of dialectic. I'm telling you, the guy's straight up. It's the same methods. It can be interpreted as a synthesis of Hegel's dialectic of ideas and Marx's dialectical materialism. Instead of either thoughts or material conditions evolving in a dialectic fashion on their own, it is the interplay between the two that produces a dialectic process. The only reason I do not use the word more prominently is that I do not want to be burdened by the excess luggage that comes with it. I find Hegel obscure and Marx propounded a deterministic theory of history that is diametrically opposed to my own view. So his only difference with Marx, actually, is he's a little bit more ideal. Apparently he likes markets. And, most importantly, he wants it to be an open-ended 
process of liberation as opposed to a directed process of returning man to his social nature. But when we're liberated, we actually return to our social nature. So it's actually the same damn thing. Uh, it's Nobody's just going to force you in a particular line that goes from capitalism to socialism to people being remade as a new Soviet man so they can have communism. So let's be real clear here about what Soros is actually saying about the cornerstone of idea of his entire theoretical approach, which is behind the interactive activities that he puts into the world with his practical approach, because theory and practice are unified. It is a dialectic. It synthesizes Hegel's dialectical idealism and Marx's dialectical materialism. His problem with Marx isn't wizard, isn't the fact that he's a stupid wizard or that he's killed a hundred million people with his bad ideas being implemented. It's that Marx proposed a closed-ended path for history to evolve toward a transcendent communism. Soros, in agreement with the later neo-Marxists in many ways, prefers an open-ended historical process with no particular destination in mind that just so happens to also be a transcendent communism. All he wants is for society to become more open. And I shouldn't say it's communism because he actually does want markets and things. He, But it's the same world that the Marxists have always envisioned for when we transcend private property. He wants the world to become, in his words, more open, which is to say that all participants in society have a fair say in the direction their society takes, which I insist is what Lenin meant by ideal democracy, which he said can only be achieved by undergoing their version of democratic centralism until it became natural for everybody who is still alive. So what Soros says next is incredibly important, and it gets us very close to the punchline explanation, which I started with, of the Soros methodology. He says, the historical process, as I see it, is open-ended. Its main driving force is the participant's bias. To be sure, it's not the only force at work, but it is a force that is unique to the historical process and sets it apart from the processes studied by the natural science. Biological evolution is attributed to genetic mutation. I contend that historical processes are shaped by the misconceptions of the participants. I would even go so far as to say that the ideas that make history consist of fertile fallacies. A fertile fallacy is originally conceived as an insight. Only when it is translated into reality do its shortcomings become apparent. It then begets another fertile fallacy that is antithetical to it. And so it goes. By the way, that is a direct reconceptualization of Hegel. Direct reconceptualization of Hegel is that the idea comes into the world, that's your thesis, and the, from within the thesis, as it's put into practice, the theoretical idea, or the practical, yeah, the theoretical idea and the practical idea, or the subjective idea and the objective idea, the contradiction becomes manifest from between them. So the antithesis of the idea arises from within the thesis. As the, dis the, the distance between the theoretical and the practical ideas become visible. He's just rewriting Hegel here. A fertile, but he calls it a fertile fallacy, is originally conceived as an insight theoretical idea, which is not the absolute idea, but it's your best guess at it. Only when it is translated into reality becomes a practical idea do its shortcomings become apparent. If you go back and listen to my Theology of Marxism lectures, you're going to find out this is exactly what I said. Then it begets another fertile fallacy that is antithetical to it. So the antithesis rises from within. And so it goes. Each fallacy provides a new experience, and to the extent that people learn from experience, the process can be described as progress. So what Hegel said is that the way you learn from experience is reflecting it off of your best guess of what's the absolute idea. What would this look like in a perfect world, the Neoplatonic idea of of of, of the ideal society. Well, there wouldn't be oppression. There wouldn't be racism. There wouldn't be starvation. There wouldn't be this in the ideal society. And we still have some of that stuff. So the process can be described as progress. He says that's his definition of progress. That's very important. Fallacy is, of course, too strong a word, he says, but it is helpful in directing attention in the right direction to the participant's bias. I shall not pursue the subject further here, but it is obvious that the concept of reflexivity, as described here, has implications far beyond the range of topics tackled in this book. And that's setting up the epilogue, which is where we started. So let me go back to the very beginning of that real quick. Its main driving force is participants' bias. To be sure, it's not the only force at work, but it is a force that is unique to the historical process and sets it apart from the processes studied by natural science, okay? So I want you to and then he says that historic, the ideas that make history consist of, uh, consist of fertile fallacies. Fertile fallacies work out this way. This is what he's actually saying here. I want to be very clear about that. There's a force in the historical process so that if you want to make history, you give people fertile fallacies. 
You give them incorrect information that gets them to act in a desired way. That's the Soros magic manipulation. But let's underscore the other point. Progress is defined as the movement of history, just like with Marx, is shaped by the misconceptions of the participants, according to Soros. Progress isn't solving actual problems that have impacts on people's lives and their quality of life. It is the result of actualizing people's misconceptions in desired directions. He says that he doesn't know the direction, but he does know the direction, which is the increased openness of society, which is the increased liberation of society, which is just two different paths to the same ideal that Marx was holding out, although Marx described it maybe in too uh, strict of terms or something or the methods or whatever. So I urge you to consider this very deeply. Soros would understand that planting the right misconceptions in people at the right places in the right times will create a movement in history that he is at least partially controlling. That is Soros's social alchemy proceeds toward operational success through the process of planting specific, targeted, intentional misconceptions designed to generate certain fertile fallacies, which are errors that cause people to behave in a way that creates change in the world, and placing those incorrect ideas into people's heads at the right times and the right places to take advantage of background conditions. So when and how is this to be done? Soros distinguishes between what he calls humdrum or near equilibrium conditions, which are basically homeostatic, and that's where the usual laws of economics apply, and historical or far from equilibrium conditions, which are reflexive, which I would tell you from dynamic systems analysis is chaotic. He's very clear in this introduction, or in the introduction, that reflexivity only really applies in the far from equilibrium state. And when everything's going just fine, that's if we use this, he likes to use biological evolution. So I know the Christians can get upset about it, but I'm going to use that. The idea in biological evolution is that normally very, very, very small amounts of variation are occurring through just the intermixing of genes. And so this male and that female were slightly more successful in their environments and they mated because they were more successful and produced more offspring. And those were more successful because of this or that. And very, very slowly, there's like this species drift. But then there's also this idea of genetic mutation, which is like a radical jump all of a sudden. And it's not actually through the sexual process. Uh, it's through errors in the sexual process or other, other genetic errors. And he's saying that basically that these are the kind of two paradigms. Near equilibrium, you have this kind of, you know, we'll move a little bit here, we'll move a little bit there. It's a very incrementalist thing. But true history changes, which is system changes, occurs in the chaotic far from equilibrium state, the equivalent of injecting a genetic mutation into the code of society. So here's how he describes these two things. He says, to put matters into perspective, we may classify events into two categories, humdrum everyday events that are correctly anticipated by the participants and do not provoke a change in their perceptions, and unique historical events, we could call them black swans, I guess, that affect the participants' bias and lead to further changes. The first kind of event is susceptible to equilibrium analysis. The second is not. It cannot be understood only as a part, sorry, it can be understood only as a part of a historical process. So historical processes are reflexive processes are happening in chaotic conditions that are the result of historical events, which are events that were unexpected and affect the participants bias to lead to change. In everyday events, the only participa uh, participating function is op oh, sorry. In everyday events, only the participating function is operative. The cognitive function is given. In other words, when stuff's just kind of going along in a stable situation, you generally know what's going on. So you're going out and you're doing activity in the world. That's like the regular sexual reproduction that causes a little bit of drift. In the case of unique historic developments, on the other hand. Both functions operate simultaneously. In other words, you don't know what's going on, so you're trying to figure it out. That's the cognitive function, but it's remember the cognitive function is dependent on the participating function, and you're out participating in the world. So theory and practice are both relevant in revolutionary conditions. Just throwing it out there in slightly different language. 
Both functions operate simultaneously so that neither the participant's views nor the situation to which they relate remain the same as they were before. That is what justifies describing such developments as historic. In other words, they change the historic paradigm. It should be emphasized that my definition of historical change involves a tautology. By the way, somewhere earlier in the introduction, he backs off and says that's not quite right in the way that I actually just explained, so I'm not going to do it again. He says, first, I classify events according to their effect on the participant's bias. Those that alter the participant's bias are historic, and those that do not are humdrum. I then claim that it changes the participant's bias that qualify, uh, of course, of it is changes in the participant's bias that qualifies a course of events as historical. So history to Soros is made by altering people's biases, particularly in the situation of chaotic or far from equilibrium conditions. Remember for him, biases is just his word for imperfect perceptions. So you're starting to see how it all works. One more piece and we put it all together and we come back to where we started. He says, when it comes to financial markets, the distortion is more serious. The participant's bias is an element in determining prices and no important market development leaves the participant's bias unaffected. The search for an equilibrium price, remember we're out of equilibrium, we're now in a chaotic situation, a stock is blowing up or crashing or a bank is failing or something. The search for an equilibrium price turns out to be a wild goose chase, and theories about the equilibrium equilibrium price can themselves become a fertile source of bias. To paraphrase JP Morgan, financial markets will continue to fluctuate. That's not actually what's happening, though. This isn't fluctuations. This is wild, far from equilibrium, chaotic changes. Fluctuations are the the stochastic noise that he doesn't even recognize as, as properly relevant. In trying to deal with macroeconomic developments, equilibrium analysis is totally inappropriate. Nothing could be further removed from reality than the assumption that participants base their decisions on perfect knowledge. People are groping, this is so important, people are groping to anticipate the future with the help of whatever guideposts they can establish. That's so important. The outcome tends to diverge from expectations, leading to constantly changing expectations and constantly changing outcomes. The process is reflexive. So let me highlight the key sentence for you. People are groping to anticipate the future with the help of whatever guideposts they can establish. So imagine you're in a chaotic situation. The economic system's blowing up. A war just started. And there's a new current thing we all have to talk about on social media. Oh my God, what's going to happen What's going to happen in the election? What's going to happen? In the, people are groping to anticipate the future. And what are they looking for? With the help of whatever guideposts they can establish. Now imagine if you're an asshole. Imagine if you're a propagandist. Imagine if you're a nudge theorist. Imagine if you're George Soros. And you're the one putting the guideposts down for people to go in a particular direction. Because they're in a chaotic situation that maybe you helped induce. And they're looking for anything that might tell them how to get out of it. And you plant the propaganda for them that leads them where you want them to go. Wouldn't that sound like social alchemy? Wouldn't it look like deception and manipulation posing as magic to cause change in a direction that gives you operational success? Of course it would. So now we have a sense of Soros' theory of history and historical change. We know it's dialectical, which is really just code for manipulative. We know it shares much in common with Hegel and Marx. In fact, it basically reproduces them. We know he is opposed to Marx's deterministic historical analysis, but parallels the wide open-ended neo-Marxist evolution of his of Marxist thinking that really ends in the same place anyway by a slightly different method. Okay, but Soros believes that history moves according to chaotic conditions or during chaotic conditions which he deems are reflexive and far away from the equilibrium. Equilibrium means stability. So when you are far from stability, in other words, in high chaos, that's when history is moving. And in such times, the reason history moves is because people are trying to anticipate the future but are not good at it. They can't do it. So they're grasping for whatever guidepost they can possibly establish for themselves to hopefully figure out what's going to happen in the election. What about their banks? What about our money? And so he also believes that people who understand this theory of change can at least position themselves as social alchemists to profit from the change. And that was the basis of his financial career. That's what this whole idea is based off of. So what do you do if you have chaotic conditions? You could plant strategic guideposts 
toward your operational success that lead people in the directions you want them to go. If you have an intention like an open society, a communist society, a technocratic new world order with social credit systems and 15-minute cities, you could create chaos and then post strategic guideposts to say these would be the solutions to these huge problems we have. Everything's so scary, but these would be solutions. That is, you place strategic propaganda to get people to make predictable mistakes, that is, fertile fallacies, in large numbers, like mass formation psychosis, that will move history in intended direction, based always on an imperfect understanding. In other words, based always on a misperception of what's really happening. Think about COVID and everything that happened in terms of what I just said. Meanwhile, you place yourself in the position to benefit from the shifts. How much money did Bill Gates say he made off of his investments leading into that, by the way? So what's an example of all this? I just gave COVID, but let's say some instability is happening in the market. Let's dumb it down a little bit, particularly one where some stock is maybe particularly over or undervalued and the adjustment is beginning or about to be about to begin. In other words, Bitcoin's about to blow up or Dogecoin's about to crash. You prefer, prepare yourself to either buy in big or to short the stock, depending on whatever it is, if you're trying to position yourself financially. But that's not all, because that leaves out the alchemy. That's you responding to the facts as best that you can. Soros says that's not what you can do. The whole process is susceptible to social alchemy. So Soros would say the act of doing all of these things, in fact, especially if you're a major institutional scale investor, will shift perceptions and potentially create a feedback loop that generates big profits for you as an investor. So let's say that you're somebody that's a really big, rich investor like George Soros, like he discusses in the book, and you start to see, you, th you decide the pound sterling maybe is overvalued, which is what he did, or that the United States dollar and the United States as a, as a functional political entity are overrated. So you start getting people to believe that they're overrated, Meanwhile, you short the currency or you short politically, sociopolitically the country. Isn't that, what you, isn't that what he does, though? So you encourage the process along by mentioning things in interviews or articles. Soros says throughout his book, that's what he did. He'd go get interviewed and he would notice that the things that he said would cause changes in the market in line with the things that he said. He could trick people because he had his expertise, because they thought he was a big, important voice. You can give things that lead people to see, whether it's getting other people to print stuff, whether it's you being in the interview or whatever, whether you getting articles commissioned or whatever, paying a journalist to tell a story so that the fertile fallacies that you need to move history in the right direction get out into the world. You say that stock is overvalued. The corporate board isn't really taking responsibility. Meanwhile, you've also prepared yourself by shorting the stock. Well, when you say that, the investors get scared and the stock crashes in value and you shorted it and you make a ton of money. In other words... You enter into a, a, a chaotic situation. You place down some strategic guideposts to help yourself actualize the reflexive potential in the chaotic situation so that it all comes down in your favor as operational success because what you've done is social alchemy by guiding the outcome of a situation that you've already invested in. You made gold out of lead. Remember in the Querying of the American Child um, that I just published with Logan Lansing? We talk about how Kevin Kumashiro says that the queer educational process is a process of inducing personal crises in children and then structuring the environment such that the crises resolve productively. Same process. That's reflexivity. So let's be a little more plain. The Soros method actualizes, and I mean actualizes in the Hegelian or Marxist sense of making theory come true. So the Soros method actualizes particular desired outcomes by fostering certain misperceptions in times of chaos so that those misperceptions act as, act as guideposts to direct people who are struggling with the chaos to make their way through that chaos. In other words, you practice social alchemy to achieve operational success by nudging and propagandizing strategically to make certain outcomes manifest by manipulating people's misunderstandings of the world around them during times of misalignment of perception and reality, which is to say reflexive conditions, which is to say chaos. You find people in chaotic situations and you propagandize them to do what you want. That's it. So what, what, what about if the conditions are relatively stable? What if the United States is doing great, for example? 
well, the revolutionary potential is low because stability repels revolutions, as I say all the time. Reflexive potential is low. You don't have this ability to run off with fertile fallacies leading to fertile fallacies leading to historic change, like George Floyd dying. What would you do if you had an agenda of operational success through social alchemy, tending toward a desired state of affairs in the midst of a stable situation? Well, the first thing you have to do is get the chaos. Because it only works in a chaotic situation. Otherwise, the society in an equilibrium situation will tend back toward equilibrium, even if that equilibrium is a moving target. In other words, even if there is societal movement, you need chaos to have historic change. So the first thing you have to do is provoke chaos. You have to stoke distrust in the stock or the nation so that it's likely to collapse. And in the moment of its collapse, you've positioned yourself to do the rest of the process. You would provoke chaos and fill the environment again with propaganda that builds a reflexive potential that points the situation in a desired direction of chaos while positioning yourself to gain as much as possible from the roughly predictable result of such agitations. In the market, for example, you might start suggesting that, say, Boeing's having problems. Oh, Boeing's really dangerous. Boeing this, Boeing that. United this, United that, United this, United that. Be really wise to start looking at who's going to short these stocks or who has been shorting these stocks, and then finding out if they have any connections. I don't know. Maybe I'm speculating, but that's how the reflexive game would work. You build the chaos. Now they're in a chaotic situation. And now that they are in a chaotic situation, um, their goal is going to be to plant certain pieces of propaganda in the direction that goes the direction they want them, want us to go, which in this case, we know they don't really want us flying. We, sus- I suspect, or I've put forward the theory that they hope that the Chinese competitor rises and Boeing falls. Um, but anyway, this occurs by building the reflexive potential through propaganda efforts until chaos erupts. And when chaos erupts, you then do more propaganda that guides people in their desperation to your trap of operational success. That's the reflexive process. So what is reflexive potential that you have to build? Well, what you want is you want to get a lot of people believing a certain bias, which is to say a certain misperception of reality that points in a particular direction and that will, when there's enough of it, go chaotic under the circumstances of a, what I say, a participating or uh, sorry, precipitating event. So, for example, you might propagandize relentlessly for years using your African-American policy forum that you fund through your Open Society Foundation about a secret subsurface systemic racism that exists particularly in policing. You might make sure that policing and, and, and the district attorneys aren't doing their jobs right, the funding isn't right, the politics work badly so that the police are struggling and the DAs are letting off criminals so there's more criminals. And then what you do is you just... Let that simmer while you put out that propaganda constantly to point it in the right direction. The reflexive potential. Brianna Taylor, say her name. Ahmed Aubrey, Trayvon Martin. There's systemic racism in policing against black people. Uh, Michael Brown. And then wait for a high-profile police encounter between a white cop like Derek Chauvin and a black suspect like George Floyd that goes sideways for the suspect and gets caught on video, goes viral, and blows up all that reflexive potential. Suddenly, everyone will misperceive that you have a society filled with systemic racism, and there's the proof. And it's specifically in the police. They're going to demand major change. There'll be riots in the street. There'll be huge protests. Defund the police. Abolish the police. We need change. Black Lives Matter. And Soros' Open Society Foundation was the primary funder of much of the critical race theory that was done in the country through not just, but specifically, uh, the outfit called the African American Policy Forum, which was run by founder of CRT Kimberly Crenshaw, for example. And it pushed many of the foolish policy decisions in the wake of the George Floyd critical race theory riots, which were themselves funded to create the perception of a mass mass outrage about this alleged systemic racism. So you agitate to get people to believe a certain thing, and when the potential for there to take it in mass formation psychosis is high enough, you wait till something pulls the trigger, and then you start putting down guideposts that lead them toward the policy decisions that you want made, like abolishing the police, which is working out great in Baltimore and working out great in cross cities in California, Portland, Seattle. Minneapolis, it's working out great. It's working out so good. 
You might also systematically destabilize cities or communities by funding crooked district attorneys that fill the environment with crime and criminals. Uh, you might push for policies that encourage drug use uh, and homeless encampments in the streets. You might encourage mass illegal migration and the policies of sanctuary cities that start pouring them across the borders and into different communities saturating the environment all along with propaganda about how crime and migration are actually caused by unfair societal conditions, a closed society, repressive tolerance, if you will, and uh, limitations to access inequities that are largely caused by the U.S. dollar-backed imperial circle and the system that they push, which is good for the people in the center. It's a benign circle in the center, but it's vicious for the participants on the outside, on the peripheries. And what you do is you just let the pressure build and let the pressure build and let the pressure build and wait for something to happen where all of that potential from the propaganda that you put explodes all at once. So Thor Soros' theory of change is pretty simple. If you want to make historical change, you run campaigns, whether they're physical, political, social, propaganda, whatever, to build reflexive potential, which is the ability to trigger a mass formation psychosis. The best way to think about that is that you're going to increase unrest and plant strategic misperceptions of what's actually happening. You're going to put the wrong analysis out there, specifically systemic analysis out there, so that when the right moment arises, all that misperception will suddenly become true for many people all at once who will then go act to demand change. Problem, reaction, solution. You put out the problem, you wait till the reaction arises, and then you give your predetermined policy solutions. In other words, as they go to act on their misperception, generate more chaos, throw the system fully out of stability, ideally it's all been set up so that it points in a certain direction because it was the operation, operational preparation of the environment pointed it in, uh, through certain guideposts, so to speak, to move in certain directions that you've anticipated and structured accordingly. And when all that arrives into those unstable, chaotic circumstances, you inject more campaigns as deliberate guideposts to lead people in the directions you desire to obtain what they call operational success. So in a short, short summary, the Soros method is destabilize circumstances strategically to generate chaos, then plant information into the chaos that moves the society in the direction of the things you want to have happen. That's Soros's theory of change. Provoke chaos and then propagandize people to go where you want them to go while they're grasping for truth. That's satanic. That's what he believes. That's what he practices. That's what he throws billions of dollars at. That's what his son Alex is even more sophisticated and vicious and radical about. Now, as for America, we can speculate beyond the empirical circle stuff as to why he's attacking America, but the West more broadly, so specifically. Uh, the reason, the target he's always shooting at is that open society, like I was saying, which would ideally be a global open society with a single international currency and bank that's organized in such a way that the largest number of global citizens of this international global order have an organic say in how their society is structured, at least allegedly or in theory. So, Strong nations with national sovereignty like the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, the countries of Western Europe can oppose this international order that he believes is necessary to increase, increase global participation in the open society and stabilize world markets through a world bank to avoid a boom-bust cycle. To change the United States and the other Western nations, he needs them thrust into chaotic reflexive conditions in such a way that they're completely unstable. And when they go into that instability, he can then direct people living in them toward his aspects of desired change toward the open society ends. So America is targeted because America is big and powerful and can stand on its own two feet outside of an international order. It can therefore decide to exclude other people from its society with no problem. That cannot be in a world that functions as an open society. The imperial circle that he identifies at the center of America has to be destroyed. Simple as that. So that's why he targets America. The reflexive method I described of creating chaos and then misdirecting people to desired ends is how he does it. And if we understand this magic trick and we can see how the narratives get built and we can see how the narratives build reflexive potential and we can diffuse the reflexive potential by exposing that it's happening, exposing the lies involved, 
by pointing out, you can't just expose the lies. That actually builds the potential further because it causes an argument. Look at what's happening with like, you know, is Christian nationalism an operation? You actually have to name it as an operation. You say they are deliberately doing this and this is the objective. Then people can start to see, oh, the best they have to call you as a conspiracy theorist at that point, but you can build out, well, here's the narrative they're building. And every time else that they built a narrative, something happened. You can get people to dial down the reflexive potential. This is like when I said Operation Drag Floyd, and then no, there was no Operation Drag Floyd. No, Drag Floyd has not yet arrived. And it might be partly due to my efforts in propagating that idea, because it took the reflexive potential. The goal, in my estimation, was to build the potential for a violent incident by pre pressing people and pressing people and pressing people and pressing people. And the second people realize they're being provoked, they don't react the same way. In other words, I, in a sense, reverse reflexed them. I got people to act differently by realizing, by perceiving, actual, but I didn't lead them into per perceptual misperception. Uh, I led them into correct perception. You're being provoked. They want you to do something stupid. They will take advantage of it. And then nothing happened. And those things that have happened, we've been able to debunk the stories very quickly and, and so on. That can be replicated. All you have to do is see how they build the narratives and what kind of make guess, shrewd guesses about what kind of precipitating events there that will, will trigger them and in what direction are they likely to be taken based on the guesses by what the narratives are pointing at. The narratives are going to point at the next level of policy uh, agendas. Plus, you can guess in terms of the broader picture. We know they want like 15-minute cities. We know they want the 30 by 30 agenda. We know that they want Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, blah, blah, blah. We know that they want a youth mental health crisis so they can justify bringing in, in that chaos, mental health resources that are going to be weaponized into social emotional learning brainwashing programs. We know these things. So if you can expose how they are in op, you can actually take the reflexive potential out of all this. We can diffuse the magic trick. And actually the Soros minded or reflexive minded, all of these guys are reflexive minded. Remember the CCP really liked it, even though they don't like Soros, the same methods, their methods fail when we learn to see through them, when we learn to see how they are a just cheap, tawdry magic trick that's manipulating people in a form of social alchemy so they get what they want. Because why? As Soros said himself, because they think they're God. We don't have to tolerate it. They don't have that authority. And we can take it away from them just by learning to spot it, calling it out, and mocking it and laughing at it when it comes up. That was the real point of this podcast. I hope this is elucidated and clarified. It was much longer than I actually expected, a full hour longer than I expected. But I hope this has clarified George Soros and George Soros's thought for you uh, and his method. In his own words, clarifying how he works, what his objectives are, and where all of this points, at least from his end of the, the program, um, I guess I'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>